morning. Can I welcome everyone to the Justice Committee's sixth meeting of 2015. Can I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as they interfere with broadcasting, even when they're switched to silent? Alice McInnes has submitted her apologies. Item one, subordinate legislation. It's a, a consideration of an affirmative instrument, the draft European Protection Order, Scotland Regulations 2015. I welcome the meeting Paul Wheelhouse, Minister for, Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs, Neil Watt, Head of EU Implementation Team, Neil Robertson, EU Policy Manager, and Craig McGuffey, Directorate of Legal Services, Scottish Government, and the Minister, of course, will give evidence in advance of the debate on the instrument. Can I invite the Minister to make a brief opening statement, please, Minister? Thank you very much, Convener, and thank you indeed for allowing me to appear before you today. I know you're very busy, and it's much appreciated. Um, these regulations in... <laughs> Just keep that going. Yes. <laughs> these, these regulations, in, in part, transpose into domestic law the terms of Directive uh, 2011/99/EU, which is uh, part of a suite of measures designed to support and protect victims across the, the EU. The general objective of the directive, as outlined in the policy note, is to provide mutual recognition across the EU of criminal protection orders, for example, non-harassment orders. Pr uh, pr practically, this uh, means that protection measures in issued in one EU country will have to be recognised across the entire EU. In this way, the protection will travel with the individual. We have liaised closely with the UK Government throughout the development of our own legislation to try and ensure consistency of approach where possible. For example, in relation to incoming European Protection Orders, or EPOs, Scottish courts will have the power to impose non-harassment orders and English courts will have the power to impose restraining orders, which are broadly equivalent. Whilst the regulations transpose most of the directive, there is also a requirement for court rules. We have therefore liaised closely with the Lord President's Office to discuss the likely requirements and the Criminal Court uh, Rules Council is currently considering this matter. Areas to be covered by court rules will include practical and administrative arrangements around the application process for an EPO, uh, notifications, modifications of EPOs and translation of forms. We expect an act of a journal to be laid in Parliament shortly. These regulations were initially laid in December 2014. There was a question as to whether the regulations as laid made adequate provision in the drafting for the definition of protective measure. Uh, obviously, that question could not be allowed to remain. As a result, the regulations were withdrawn so that this matter could be resolved. During reconsideration of the regulations, a question also arose as to the criminal penalty that could be applied using Section 2.2 of the European Communities Act. After due consideration, the regulations were amended to provide for a maximum penalty of two years imprisonment to ensure that they were within VRAs. Uh, the administrative and procedural uh, aspects of the new EPO regime will fall, for the most part, to the Scottish Court Service, and we have therefore worked closely with them to ensure that the relevant arrangements are in place prior to this new regime coming into force. As the committee uh, will appreciate, it is difficult to ascertain likely volumes of incoming and outgoing EPOs, given we are establishing a completely new process. However, we anticipate the numbers will be low, and we do not foresee any significant financial implications of the regulations. We will, however, continue to liaise closely with uh, the court Scottish Court Service and other key stakeholders to monitor the operation of EPOs once introduced and any practical or financial impact. We have also written to victim support organisations, advising them not only of the new regime, but indicating that, as always, uh, we are open to comments in due course about how the new system is working in practice. And it goes without saying the Scottish Government is fully committed to strengthening the rights and protection of victims, and we believe that these regulations, along with the associated court rules, will enhance those rights and that protection. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. John Fiddy. Good morning, Minister. Good morning, Minister. Minister, I, I, I think you've probably covered it with a, a comment you made there. In the consultation, understandably, be referred to the liaison with all the, on the technical side of things, the court side, um, and in the quality impact assessment, it says that, that the main impact is expected to be around domestic abuse. When you talk about victims' groups, can you explicitly include Scottish Women's Aid? Because it does. It, you, the, the, the paper we have here does talk about uh, that there will continue to be consultation how it operates in practice, but they're not specifically mentioned. It was all, if you like, in-house groups. So, can you confirm that they would be? I can certainly, uh, given undertaking that, we will consult with um, Women's Aid, Scottish Women's Aid, to see if they have any concerns uh, about this, and obviously keep them informed of of the work as it un unfolds, and make sure that uh, any evaluation evidence we do consult with the likes of Scottish Women's Aid. I, I agree with Mr. Finney that they are a very important group that pr protect the interests of victims of, of such crimes. Okay, many thanks. Clarify this, of course, not that there wouldn't be criminal proceedings following domestic abuse, but there might be. But there is also, I believe, a civil order that parallels this. Is it in the same time frame? Is it just a matter of interest? I, 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 just double-check with colleagues if that's yet. Yeah, I believe it is, yes. Yeah. Uh, that's correct. You know. 
Uh, Elaine, followed by Margaret. Yeah, um, I think the, the civil one actually is already in force, is it not? It came into force on the 11th of January. So, okay. uh, yeah, I mean, I was interested in the, the uh, equal, uh, equal impact, quality impact assessment as well as that it was that the sorts of crimes that this would particularly apply to would be crimes of domestic abuse, and therefore, you know, obviously anything which pre uh, prevents perpetrators from being, get, being able to get away with it by moving elsewhere is, is to be desired. Um, you also mentioned that we didn't think there would be significant financial implications for the Scottish Court Service. If this proves not to be the case, are measures in place or will measures be in place in order to try and... Because we've heard already about financial pressures on the Court Service. Will there be the ability to, to compensate the Court Service if it doesn't turn out to be the case? Well, it's certainly something that we're, we're aware of. I mean, as I said in my opening statement, it's very difficult to predict the exact volumes, but um, maybe ask Neil Robertson to come in very briefly about European supervision orders, because we think the volumes will be, be similar to that. Um, but we can obviously come back to the committee with further, further detail to justify this position. But um, I understand the numbers are very low in the case of European supervision orders, and therefore we don't anticipate there would be a huge number of, of cases that would uh, potentially impact on the Scottish courts. But obviously we'll keep that under review, and if it turns out that... Uh, uh, that, that the volumes are higher than anticipated, then obviously we would speak to the Scottish Court <laughs> Service. If there are particular resource issues, we can take that into account. But if we maybe could we just invite Neil Robertson to explain yes. the yes. European Supervision Order position as well. Yes, uh, the committee, what we recall, we, we spoke to you last year about the European Supervision Order, and at the time we anticipated the numbers to be about 7 to 10 a year. We think the European Protection Order um, will have similar numbers, but as with any new European measure, it's very hard to predict from the outset, and I, I, we also gave an undertaking with the DSO to, to, to monitor and a, for any adverse financial impact, and obviously that would be the same with the European Protection Order as well. Thank you. Margaret. Uh, you referred to the delay due to drafting and clarifying the cr criminal penalty. But um, has there been any, or is there likely to be any uh, consequence of uh, this only being kind of introduced and implemented now? We, um, we're, we're conscious of the, the delay and the transposition sort of deadline um, issue. Uh, we haven't to date had any applications um, that have affected us, so um, we're hopeful that uh, given the, the timing obviously of today's committee meeting and uh, indeed if, if Parliament agrees with the, with the measure we can get it implemented quickly. Um, but we, we don't have any immediate um, difficulties. We, we could, uh, I understand, if necessary, take out a civil interdict if, there was, if it was necessary to take steps in the, in the meantime. Uh, if there was something that emerged immediately, um, and obviously we can we can discuss that if if, if required, but um, uh, we are confident that we can we can get this up and running quickly um, if the committee agrees with the measure. Thank you. I'd like to ask um, if there's a breach of a protection order. Let's say somebody coming from a European country is here breaching the protection order. Who enforces uh, what are the penalties? Who enforces the penalties and what penalties? And to which country do these penalties get enforced? Someone from another EU member state yes, is, is in, in Scotland. Or and vice breaches. versa, and they breach a protection order, then yep. presumably there are penalties, criminal penalties falling from that. Under which legislative procedure does it go? Let's say it's somebody from Scotland who breaches it by following somebody to Germany or whatever. Is it Scottish law that would prevail there because they've breached an order in Scotland? I just want to know how it's done. Well, um, I suppose the key thing is to say it's about us um, respecting a, an order that's been issued in another country. So similarly, it would apply that if, if, um, uh, if, if somebody was in Spain, for example, and breaching an order that had been um, set in Scotland, then they would uh, be committing an offence in, effectively in Spain. And that, so it would be recognised the fact it had been issued. But I'll just double-check with the, uh, Craig, Craig can, can clarify the legal position, if I may bring in Craig on this one. If the, the European Protection Order is made in Spain... Um, that European protection order is, is passed to the authorities in Scotland. The Scottish authorities will imp uh, impose a non-harassment order. A breach of that non-harassment order in Scotland is a crime in Scotland, and it would be punishable under the... Just simply to know about where, where the jurisdiction would fall yeah. if there was a breach. Uh, but the, the same vice, sorry, the, the, the same uh, vice versa. If, if uh, uh, okay. somebody in Scotland has an EPO, that transfers to Spain. It's enforced in Spain through a Spanish restraining order. Um, and breach of it there would fall under... Uh, yeah. Spanish, Spanish law. Have, That's okay. fine. That's clear for me. Thank you very much. I have no other, see no other questions. Um, I therefore now move on to um, 
Item 2, which is the formal debate on the motion to approve the instrument. I invite the Minister to move motion S4M 12361, the Justice Committee recommends the draft European Protection Order Scotland Regulations 2015 be approved. Do mem any members wish to speak in the debate on the motion? No. Um, the question is that uh, motion S4M 12361 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. As members are aware, we are required to report on all affirmative instruments. Are you content to delegate responsibility for me to sign off this report? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister, Thank for you. your officials. And I'll suspend for a couple of minutes to allow the nameplates to be changed for the next item. The next item of business is a one-off roundtable evidence session on agricultural crime, and I welcome the witnesses to the session. Um, and each of you should have a copy of the table plan, your desk. And I'm going to go around the table anti-clockwise and invite each member and participant to introduce myself. And I'll start with myself. But before I do that, have you you've not all done a roundtable discussion before? Right, so it simply is, if you indicate to me it's more interaction between yourselves as witnesses with the occasional permissible intervention by members of the committee, but um, 
what you do is just indicate to me if you want to come in and I'll call you and your your automatically your light will go on with the speak light lit up and this will light up. Okay? So you just indicate to me and I'll call you out if I've got a list, I'll call you out the order on the list that I'm going to call people and feel free. It's supposed to be an easier way to gain evidence within a, a short period of time. We'll see how it works. Well, I'm Christine Graham, and I chair the Justice Committee, and I'm the MSP for Midlothian, South Tweeddale and Lauderdale, which is a rural community in the main. Good morning. I'm Gina Durrimple. I'm the Head of Policy in, from the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. I'm afraid I am a, a last-minute stand-in um, because Mr Dysart, that was due to be here, is unfortunately not well today. I'm sorry, I'm going down clockwise instead of anti Clockwise. <laughs> it's been that kind of a day for me, by the way. It's going to disintegrate further. Yes, next, please. Good morning. I'm Jane Baxter, MSP for Mid-Scotland and Fife. <coughs> Hi everyone, Jamie Smart, NFU Scotland. I've just cha taken over the legal and technical chair and I farm in West Lothian. Matt and Matt. morning, John <laughs> Finney, MSP Highlands and Islands. Hi, my name's Martin Malone, I'm regional manager for the NFU Mutual Insurance for Scotland and Ireland. Good morning, Christian Ladd, North East MSP. Good morning. I'm Robbie Allen, Detective Chief Superintendent from Police Scotland. I have a responsibility for local crime within Police Scotland. Is it me? Or it is Gil. I'm it? looking at uh, you. I just don't want to get into trouble. <laughs> uh, Gil Patterson, MSP for Clyde Bank Mulgay. I'm Dr Robert Smith. I'm a Professor of Enterprise and Innovation at the University of West of Scotland. And I'm an academic and former policeman with an interest in agricultural crime. Thank you. I'm Roderick Campbell, MSP for a significantly rural North East Fife. Hey, I'm Douglas Scott. I'm Senior Policy Advisor with Scottish Borders Council. Hey, I administer the Scottish Borders uh, Police, Fire and Rescue and Safer Communities Board and I work very closely with the Integrated Safer Communities um, Service within Scottish Borders Council. Margaret Mitchell, MSP Central Scotland. Morning, Theresa Dougal, Regional Manager with Scottish Land and Estates. I'm uh, Elaine Murray, uh, MSP for Dumfriesshire and Vice Convener. I'm interested to hear what we say today because I just heard on the radio this morning about £20,000 worth of forestry equipment being stolen from the Barony College in my constituency just yesterday. So, yeah. I think the point to also made before we start is that many of us represent, uh, all of us practically sitting around this table, rural communities or substantially rural communities, which belies the central belt uh, stigma that's attached to the Parliament that, we, you know, somewhere it's urban. Many of us have these, and that's why we thought it very important on suggestion of Margaret Mitchell, because she came up with the suggestion that we have this uh, round table. I think it's very, um, very useful, and I hope we can pursue it further, subject to what comes out. So, just like to start, anybody want to start asking? Um, we had a bit about what is, um, I, what is agricultural crime or rural crimes, and maybe I don't want an academic treatise on it, but it, you know, give an idea of the topics, uh, Dr. Smith, that we might be looking at. Agricultural crime or farm crime is uh, a category of crimes that uh, the c <coughs> mainly theft of various types uh, but it's part of rural crime and also it could be subsumed with other things like green criminology or uh, wildlife crime or waste crime uh, so it's it's very location based and specific to particular areas. What what forms agricultural crime is different in the UK to other countries, but uh, that is a quite a short uh, yeah. version of what it is. We're not going to focus much on the environmental today, yeah. rather than artifacts, equipment, yeah. cattle, things like that. So. Could we possibly have um, somebody pitch in, indicate they want to say something? Surely, Mr Smart, you've got something to say. You're a, a working farmer, so let's hear. Just, it does take in everything. Everything from the, the, the wee bits of scrap that we all have lying around our yards that will disappear one day, right out through to the half million pound piece of machinery. Um, it also brings in the irresponsible access-taking, 
and sheep worrying. It's absolutely everything. And it's, it is everything from the very, very low level right up to virtually millions of pounds worth of equipment. What about your experience and your members? Want give us some examples that you can sort of pluck for us. There's, well, there's one that's been in the press just last week. A um, member had 70 sheep killed by dogs. The um, reason it was in the press was that it went to court and the owner of the dogs um, had a £400 fine. The, our member has had £20,000 worth of damage and costs, which he has had to, he's not even been able to make a claim in his insurance because there's been a, a criminal case going on. So that's just one instance that's affected a member in West Lothian. Theresa Dugo. I had a meeting yesterday with one of our members as well, um, who's in the borders, but over the hill you actually as well have South Lanarkshire. And what he was saying was one of the, the main issues that they're being hit hard for is theft of livestock. And what they're finding as well, I mean, I've actually got a list here of five farms in the area. Um, and they're saying as well that even from the one farm, on a typical year, they're losing anything from 30 upwards um, ewes. Um, they actually did say yesterday to try and give a kind of cost to this. They would say that for each you that they lose, you could be looking at the, what would you would pay for a new quad bike because it's not just the loss of the you, it's the lamb and subsequent followers thereon. Mr Scott. Certainly from the research that we've done in rural climb, um, basically it's mainly theft. But there's also vandalism and also loss of livestock as well, and also livestock injury as well. We've had, we've had incidents with regard to horses, etc. So that, that's a sort of range of things that we are, but we're looking at. But the theft is the main, the main thing. Theft of it's theft of equipment uh, it could be generators, power tools, quad bikes, uh, that sort of thing. Mr. Malone. Yeah, well, the meter we have. Well, the largest rural insurer across the UK. We insure roughly 65% of farming in Scotland. I mean, the main items stolen are quad bikes, tools and fuel are the top three items of equipment stolen. Cattle and rustling is also a major issue. Um, 2013, we had 26 incidents costing £127,800. And last year, we had 25 incidents costing £82,000. So it's a significant cost implication as well. Um, and the other side, then, you get what we would see as maybe more organised crime, where you have larger items of equipment stolen, such as large-value tractors, harvesters. Um, that's not likely to be opportunist. It's more likely to be more from an organised crime. And we've recovered some of these items as far away as Poland with a, a very significant cost. The total cost last year was about £2 million. How did you track them? That's up not to the going to tell service. me. Better not tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I asked. It's a secret. We do have a recovery unit, um, and we do we do work very closely with the police across the whole of the UK, mm -hmm. and we have a we have a dedicated unit looking at recovery of um, stolen vehicles and items. DCL, yes. Yeah, when we started looking at this, <laughs> we don't have a specific category of rural crime or farm crime, so, but it is a acquisitive crime is what we were looking at. And, and when we started looking at it, the, the, the we basically went by location, and it's very much crimes recorded that we have related to theft of equipment, vehicles, livestock, and a small proportion of vandalisms and fire raisins as well was another one that, that, that we looked at as well as, as coming under this, this category that, that, that we're looking at today. And then when we did look at the livestock, it was mainly sheep, cattle, small proportion of chickens as well within that. But from Police Scotland's point of view, that, that, that's what we kind of started to look at as far as, as rural farm crime was concerned. It was interesting you mentioned fire raising because one at Borthwick Farm in my yeah. constituency was just reported, which surprised me. Why would somebody do fire raising in a farm? I don't understand. <laughs> Vandalism, presumably, of something. Yeah. Kind, yeah. Do members want to come in and, uh, and feel that they want Margaret? Organised um, side of, of crime. You've mentioned more uh, local policing. I, I would term it. How do you address the organised side? From our point, like any type of criminality, we base it on whatever evidence we're getting. The people we're arresting, the intelligence that we're obtaining, helps us to paint the picture as to whether we do have 
a group that we can target as an organised crime group. That there's little doubt for, for for individuals to manage to steal high value equipment and get it as far as Poland. If we use that example, there's a significant amount of organisation involved in that. But for us to target the group that, that potentially is involved in that, we need to identify who that group is in the first instance, how they are operating as a group, what, what the enablers are in place to allow them to undertake that criminality. And that's very much intelligence driven from us. And that's why that those links into the local community, those different ways that we gather intelligence are so important to us to try and build that picture. We would then utilise the same... Uh, tactics that we would use against any other organised crime, be they involved in money laundering, drugs, but it doesn't matter if they're organised and they're undertaking criminality, there are certain tactics we can then deploy to, to, to basically dismantle that organised crime group and stop them undertaking it, what they're doing. So th there is no doubt that, that for the higher value stuff there needs to be, and that's not to say there's not some in relation to some of the lower level, lower level crime, some organisation involved in that. What we, I would also say about organised crime is they are involved in significant criminality across our communities and they will also take the opportunity wherever it presents itself and, and they will, won't restrict themselves just to rural crime or they will just take the opportunity where they can make money wherever it is and if that means that they can see something that they're they looking to do an opportunity within a rural environment they'll take that as well but it might be that they're their day-to-day -day business is something else but they will they will branch out as and when that they see the opportunity I'm just Dr. Smith in on the same thing. And I was just on that point of picking up. You said you knew um, who the perpetrator were, were, who the perpetrators were, and in the NFU um, document that I think came in quite late to committee, they said there was a, a kind of frustration that although the perpetrators were known, the police they didn't have resources really to pursue this, and this was a, a frustration. Um, would you like to comment on that aspect when it's still with the police and resourcing? <sighs> I would need to say, that, I mean, it can be a, a sense of frustration for us as well, where you may know or may have an idea of who's involved in that criminality, but proving that is a completely different, uh, a, a different problem for us. Um, so, sorry, that's my phone. Oh. Unfortunately, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on call. Unfortunately, for Police Scotland today. So. Not, not my no, I know that I, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I won't tell you what dire if you're electronic. So everybody else, you better check. <laughs> <laughs> Only pacemakers are allowed to see on. Okay? Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what we do, if, if the inquiry is a local inquiry, it will remain within the division to undertake that, that, that inquiry. If we create these links or establish these links to a more organised uh, footing, then that, can, that division will then get support from more central-based uh, resources from within Specialist Crime Division. Um, and that's when I was talking earlier on about the tactics that you would use to, to tackle an organised crime group. If there are specific instances where we don't think that the police have responded in a manner that, that we would want, I'd like to know about that because obviously I've got responsibility for local crime and I would like to think there is an appropriate response to, to every crime and, and there is a robust and thorough investigation. What we do is we have a process in place where a crime has been established and reported to us once it's recorded, it's then monitored as it goes through the lifetime of that inquiry. So, and it needs to be an audit trail as to what inquiry has been undertaken in relation to that crime. So, and we will not complete or write or finish or finalise an inquiry until everything has been exploited that should have been exploited. Now, whether that is CCTV, door-to-door -door inquiry, forensic evidence, everything needs to be done. So, I'd be really disappointed if, if, if members are saying that there has been an, a, an insufficient response to what is a, a serious crime. Okay. Uh, I'm just hoping it wasn't a report about agricultural crime and I've stopped you in your tracks <laughs> and we'll, that'll be the headline. Um, yes, Dr Smith. I think one of the problems is in relation to intelligence gathering and the fact that from my research into uh, the theft of tractors in the UK, there seems to be organised crime groups centred around various urban areas uh, one that was uh, identified was Carlisle. There was North Yorkshire, Lincolnshire. Uh, there was also Manchester, Coventry. Uh, and a lot of these organised crime groups travel once they've targeted an area. So I think there may be an element of cross-border and Police Scotland 
possibly simply don't have the intelligence on it because until you know that someone's travelling to a particular area, it's hard to keep track on uh, groups that move around the country. I would, I would say that's an area that, that Police Scotland has afforded us a, a much better opportunity <coughs> to establish those cross-border links, particularly in the past, maybe we eight different forces trying just to tie all of that up. It's much easier now when you've got one force. We already have got very good uh, links into both the North East and the North West in England so that we've got that cross-border coverage as well because there's no doubts our criminals, whatever they're involved in, are travelling up and down between Scotland and England. So we need to be very aware of that, the exact point you're making there. And, and I think it's an area that we're actually improving greatly in because we've now got those that linkage that you would that, that, that help us with that. Because um, the next um, point that NFU Scotland make is they thought the problem had been exacerbated by the centralisation of Police Scotland very often because the local knowledge isn't there, leading to a, a slow response time, which seems to be the opposite, really, of, of what you say. Absolutely. I, I would refute that quite clearly. I mean, Police Scotland has not taken police officers away from the, the, the local areas. They're still within the communities. The officers who would be the first responders are still the first responders, whether they were a legacy force or whether they're a division within a uh, Police Scotland. What there is now is that there is a much more coordinated central support for the inquiries as they, they escalate and they become more organised or that the value increases and, and we need to put more support in behind it. I, I think that the, the local response still needs to be the most, uh, will be the most effective one because that's where you will get that initial evidence grab. That's where you've got the opportunity of getting some sort of, of quick evidence that takes us down the line of a detection, that's still going to be the most important. And that's not changed, whether it's Police Scotland, Lothian and Borders, Northern, Strathclyde, those officers are still within the communities. I'm going to take uh, on these issues, and we take witnesses first. So I've got Mr Smart, Mr Scott and uh, Theresa uh, Dougal. On my members list, I've got John, Elaine, Roderick and Christian. But if you want to... Come in and supplement, you know, if somebody's answering, just let me know. But that's the system just now. So, Mr Smart, first, well, you, obviously, NFU. Yes, thank you. Um, just to respond to DCS Allen's uh, comments there, what we find when we're trying to report crime is actually getting the call handler in the control room to understand where we are. To let you understand, when, when you're in a rural area, you give a postcode. My postcode covers a mile radius. So even to find the farm can be difficult. Then to say that the, you know, the sheep have been stolen from the hog, it means nothing to a control, you know, a control room person who might be in the middle of Edinburgh. And that's where we, we feel <coughs> that we have lost local contact. Once we get to the local police person, it's a lot better. Yes. But the control room quite often just doesn't know where we are. That's a good point. I've had difficulty finding some farms in my lifetime. <laughs> Three-point turns and funny tracks in different places in most unsuitable vehicles. Uh, Mr Scott. The Scottish Borders were very lucky because we have an integrated safer communities unit, which is the police are heavily involved in that. They lead it with uh, council staff and an antisocial behaviour team. We've got our drugs and alcohol unit. We've got our fire and rescue people all working together, focusing on communities. We're actually in the middle of a campaign at the moment on uh, t trying to prevent crime on farms and we're sending out information packs to 1,100 farms uh, across the Scottish borders uh, through, through this in terms of giving farmers advice about uh, what they should do to protect their equipment, their outbuildings, etc. We're also uh, encouraging farmers to uh, sort of take part in our Scottish Borders Alert Scheme whereby we can email um, or phone uh, people about uh, crimes or everything that's happening and everything that's happening in a particular area. And we've, we've got overall in Scottish borders, it's for the whole of the borders, but we've, there's 2,000 people, over 2,000 people signed up to that. So we feel there's a, there's a powerful thing for the farming community and we're also supporting Farm Watch as well. So we feel that in terms of everything's about evidence and it's about prevention and early intervention. And so we feel through our integrated unit, we're taking a very preventative approach and it involves police right at the heart of that. So really, we feel that, um, you know, uh, things are, we've got a lot of strength in that from the Scottish Borders point of view. Uh, 
has it had an impact? Has it made a difference? Well, I, I mean, think you can have all that. Yeah. And nothing well, certainly, uh, it's, certainly, crimes, uh, sort of crimes of theft are down uh, in 2014-15 in the Scottish border. There's a lot. There's, there's issues. I know that one of the issues we have, however, is the the the, um, the price, the cost of that, the the, the cost of the equipment are, are going up because it seems to be a higher value type type crime that's taking place. But uh, we, our, our actual crime and theft is going down. So there, there is some evidence, but it's still early days yet. Um, concur as well with what Jamie said with regards to the geographic area. The other thing that we've been working though, with members on as well, though, and um, police in several areas, is to actually try and raise awareness of the impact of the crimes on the rural business. And also, a lot of our members are actually asking as well for greater clarity um, on how the report crime, whether they report it to 101 or whether they report it to... 999, because they feel as well that, well, they completely understand um, that there is resourcing issues. Um, they understand the difficulty faced by the police and actually where the, the resources should go to. But what they're saying as well is that um, they would like more guidance on the best approach when actually reporting the crimes as well. Um, one of the suggestions that has been made and that we're looking into, and we have a meeting set up down in Stranraer next month with the area commander, is actually to look at the possibility of providing what we're classing more or less as awareness raising events for the officers to actually get them out onto the, the farms and the estates to look at the business so that they can actually gain a better understanding of what happens on the farms and the estates and also to have that kind of joined up approach and communications going both ways of what the rural crimes are, what the issues are, um, the difficulties being faced by the farmers, land managers and the police because the one thing is the only way that that we can actually look to improve the situation is to work better together. Thank you very much. I'm going to take members now. John, then Elaine, please. Give them a point that Mr Smart made, and, and whilst acknowledging everyone's knowledge is time limited, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a question for Mr Rumpel about compensation orders. I certainly, in my time as a police officer, uh, I recall dealing with a, 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 a significant incident of sheep worrying. Now, this isn't a couple of sheep being chased around the field. This is a field full of sheep slaughtered, or, you know, and, and you can imagine the, the cost and uh, uh, for the farmer. Is it not a matter of routine that in a circumstance like Mr Smart outlined that a compensation order would be applied for? It, it depends entirely on the circumstances of the offence. I mean, obviously, the fiscal themselves have up to £5,000 power um, in terms of compensation order that can be um, given without... That's, that's a fiscal direct measure without the case going to court. But obviously, the courts... And I can't obviously con um, comment on the sentencing of the courts. Um, and I'm sure the convener is very aware of, of my limitations in respect of that. But um, the court could impose um, compensation, yes. Um, what, what the court needs to have available to them is obviously all the information in terms of the impact. And I think that, that's the one thing that I've picked up this morning, is that a, a lot of the information that we have in, in terms of our report is the financial impact of the value. But actually, what, what I'm taking from this session already is that there, there is a wider impact. It's actually a wider impact for the future and, and moving forward for the businesses, which is something that, that, that we need to take back uh, and learn from. Thank you. Can I ask then, is there a protocol which, if the direct measures refused, a compensation order would still form part of the representation the fiscal would make at any subsequent trial? We, we, we can't um, ask the court to impose, impose a compensation order. We can um, ask the court and make the court available of the financial loss and the impact. And then it's a matter for the court as to whether they will impose a compensation order. We, we're not allowed to advise the court in terms of sentencing. There are very limited circumstances that we can do that. that. Something that would be related by the fiscal, then, and for instance, a sheep worrying case. The the, and from the police report, then yes. But that, that's what I'm saying. I'm going back to my original point that often we will have the financial loss just in, in a value, whereas it would probably be more helpful to have the ongoing impact, etc., um, for, for the business going forward. And yes, that's certainly information that if we have, we can make sure the court is aware of that information. I don't quite can ask insurers, surely when someone's claiming for loss, they're not just claiming for their 30 use, they're not claiming for concomitant losses that are reasonably 
attached to it. On, on the basis of yo's that were maybe in lamb, it would just be for the yo, the loss of the yo. Oh, I see. So that wouldn't be helpful then yeah. in, in compensation. I mean, it's quite interesting on the worrying one. The numbers of worrying over the last two years have remained the same, but the cost has almost doubled. But I mean, would it have been a, of assistance, yeah. you know, to compensation yeah. orders? But obviously not. No. John? It, no, but I, I think it would be helpful to, 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 if that could maybe be picked up, if some, some plan around that. That's because a good point. It, it, it's not sometimes. Compensation. Financial compensation will always be welcome, sure, by victims, but almost it's a recognition sometimes. And people, you know, as we know throughout the court system, feel sometimes that their full circumstances haven't been taken in uh, cognizance of. So it would be helpful if that could be picked up on, please. Whose Thank job you. is it to, to provide that information? <coughs> we will, we will um, go from the information uh, normally contained with the standard um, police report, but so we, we, we will have liaison with the, with the police in terms of if we require any further information, then the police are, are ordinarily very, very helpful in, in establishing any further information that we require. For compensation? For the purposes of offering That's compensation, certainly in terms of... Uh, if we were offering a compensation order in terms of our fiscal direct measure powers. No, I'm talking about oh, in the terms court. of the court. Whose job is it to, to provide well, this we will, information? The, 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 the fiscal court. will provide the, the information to the court and we will rely on the police um, to help us yeah. obtain that information. Elaine. Oh, I beg your pardon. Sorry, Mr. Malone. Just to clarify, I mean, if a yo was in lamb, that lamb would be covered within a compensation okay, payment, okay. but not the con consistent loss of that if it was no, brought through to production. No, but too remote. Yes, yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Elaine. Uh, in terms of uh, the theft of livestock or specialist equipment like the forestry equipment at the Barony, how much evidence is that people are actually stealing for a market and that a purchaser has already been identified? Because I would imagine that um, <coughs> livestock, you're not going to put, yeah, you're not going not to sort of take them down the, the car boot sale with, or, or whatever, that actually it's being stolen with somebody in mind who already knows that you know, you're going to purchase or going to steal something for them and how much Therefore, is there the prosecution, or how often is, is there the person who's in receipt of the stolen goods prosecuted? Because actually some highlighting of that might actually help to dampen the um, enthusiasm for allowing people to steal these types of goods. Who wants to take this up? Yes, thank you. I think we need to understand no matter what it is that's stolen, the person that's stealing it has an outlet for it, a market for that, whatever it is they're stealing. So there's no... But what you will find is, I would say, in relation to a rural or agricultural crime, th there will still be some opportunists within that where they absolutely th they will know roughly how they can get rid of something and, and it might not just be exactly what, what it was that, that they wanted that they stole, but if there's an opportunity to steal something, they will steal it. But yeah, yeah you're dead right, that particularly around about livestock, etc. I would expect there to be, before anyone goes and steals anything, some method by which they know they can just get rid of that and make their make their money from it. So that's where we need to to probably target a bit more upstream in relation to the to, to the criminal activity. The person actually going on to the farm and stealing the property is one person. It's who's actually involved in, in facilitating that the, the pro stolen property from getting being basically sold on or, or, or doing whatever they want to do with it. That's that's the real ones. That's the ones that we really want the good intelligence on, and that's the ones that we should, if we maybe focused on those, if and when we can get that opportunity, that will help further down the chain. In relation to the theft of livestock, particularly sheep, I think a lot of it would be destined, f and it's linked with food fraud. So there is a there is a an ongoing market all the time for sheep, particularly sheep, uh, for the halal uh, market. Uh, and there, there is a well-documented phenomena. So there is a, an outlet continually for that. And in relation to the theft of tractors and livestock and uh, tractors and uh, machinery, uh, there is a lot of evidence that they turn up in, in <coughs> Poland, they turn up in Africa, Afghanistan. Uh, so in one documented, well-documented case in England, it was a Turkish businessman who had arranged through a local crime group who stole it, and it was then shipped to Southampton and then shipped to Turkey. And it was all done through semi-legal. Even the people transporting it didn't know it was a stolen tractor. 
to them. So there is a there is a high degree of so there's organisation of mafias and things, but uh, you know until such an instance is reported, uh, it's difficult to know. And until there are a number more cases, it's difficult to profile and find out uh, if there's thefts in the area where the connections are, because the local police might just not know. And it's, you know, I mean, if you don't know, you can't marshal and direct your resources. So, you know, there is, there is different elements of it. There is opportunists, there is organised crime. And Sorry, are you saying that there should be more liaison with local police at what we might have called, and I don't mean it's low level, but in inverted commas, no. low level mm -hmm. theft of mm -hmm. one, let's say one track, though devastating for the, for the farmer landowner, mm -hmm. that there should be more liaison with the police at serious organised crime so they can see there's a, an actual pattern Yes. That it's a tractor here and there's something there and there's something. And is that not happening? Uh, sorry, I think I, I think that in I think the with Police Scotland being formed, there is would be a greater level of intelligence sharing than there possibly was before. But uh, within Scotland there are a number of intelligence systems. You take it into England and Wales and practically every force has a different intelligence system. So it's quite labour intensive and time consuming to follow up and make sure that every instance is known everywhere because the if it's a travelling crime group and they're coming up from Manchester or Birmingham, they may have no known connection to the area. So yes, there is a need for it, but uh, I think in Scotland as well, the Scottish councils and the Scottish police have a very good level of cooperation, probably more than is the case in some of the English and Welsh forces. But there's more could be done. Uh, so there is there is a need for it. But w with more, so more could be done. More could be such done. as more could be done, <laughs> such as uh, well, like. In Lincolnshire Police and some of the other rural constabularies, they have uh, rural intelligence officers, farm intelligence officers. They have local special constables with links to the farming community and, and things. Uh, so there are a number of various things that can be done, but their time and uh, cost, you know, there are time and cost elements and particularly when you're going through a period of organisation and you have other high-level crimes, it is, about, uh, it is about putting your resources where you know they're most effective. And I think that uh, farm crime is something that is uh, becoming more prevalent than it was before. So. Just, just like DCS Allen in on that. Yeah, I, I, I'm not as... I'm more comfortable with the local arrangements in place, the sort of ones that have been described. I think we get that. We, we are, the, the, the real challenge for us is that tractor that's stolen in one locality mm -hmm. and the local officer turning up and doing that initial bit of investigation, maybe understanding that the car that was seen to facilitate that was also seen 150 miles away in the theft of a bailer or it was seen somewhere else. That we're much better at creating those linkages now within Police Scotland with one force. That's easier for us to do. Um, so I think that it is a challenge for us, but that's where I think that's where we make the most impact on the organised aspect of it. The, the locals taking the opportunist theft within the local area, I think the local cops are well placed to, to deal with that. It's just when it breaks out of that and it, be, and, and it starts to cut across across border, across wide areas of Scotland, I think we're good now at being able to create that blue BMW was seen at such and such a farm acting suspiciously. And then three days later, we can see it at another farm, and you can link that. We're, we're getting better at that, I would need to say. Sorry, I mean, if, if tractors are being stolen to go to Poland or, or Turkey or whatever, I mean, they're not just going to take one tractor. Presumably, there will be some sort of uh, 
a variety of different pieces of equipment being taken over at the same time. So is it maybe, you know, trying to link up not just what's happened 150 miles away, but there's maybe been one stolen in Cornwall, there's maybe been one stolen up in the Highlands of Scotland and they're all being brought together. So it's actually, you know, how, how easy is it to link those right across the UK? Again, it's, it's getting easier because when they come to Scotland to deal with one police force, so what we know is a much more coordinated uh, picture of what's happening in Scotland. Our linkage into the forces down south <laughs> is not as easy because they do have still a lot more forces down there, some different sizes, different intel systems, etc. So getting that sort of information can be a bit more problematic, but it's not insurmountable, and, and we can do that. And, and as you say, it sounds a bit simplistic, but they're probably at that stage where they're looking to, to get as much equipment of whatever sort it is on a boat going out to a location so again that's what I keep talking about going back up the chain a bit up to that level so that it's very important a person to go around the farm and steal the actual equipment but if we can get further up the chain to actually who's facilitating that and who's actually directing those individuals to go into farms that's we need to target that as well but we, all, we do absolutely need to get that investigation right at the time when the, when the cops turn up at that location make sure that we are absolutely identifying any eyewitnesses, we are identifying any opportunities for CCTV and other rural locations, but they're all, everybody's got their own private space now, everybody's got, there's an opportunity for that. Forensically, we need to do the right things forensically because people do leave traces where they've been, so we need to get that sort of thing right at the time and then create and make sure that we understand the linkages that sit above that. So we'd be like drug dealers and so on, that you're looking further up to get the missing Absolutely, breaks, that's it. Roderick. Yeah, thank you. Convener. Um, in terms of kind of high spec farm equipment, tractors and the rest of it, is uh, the technology as robust as it might be in terms of protecting those vehicles? I, I mentioned that because I was talking to uh, someone yesterday about this very issue, suggested that high spec tractors, if you have one high spec tractor, then it's quite easy to use the kind of the keys for that one high spec tractor to. to uh, kind of acquire another high-spec tractor um, because the technology is not as unique as it might be. I don't know if you comment on that one. Um, I think the machinery manufacturers, we've been working very closely with them to try and encourage them to vary the, the fact that in some cases one key will switch on a number of different machines um, and they are slowly moving. So there is some work that's being done that way. I mean, from an insurance point of view, we would encourage anybody with any sort of high-value item to have tracker and Caesar attached to that so they can track it, and, it can, uh, and, and Caesar marking effectively will do that. And we give fairly substantive discounts to do that. And, and I think the industry is moving closer there because there's an encouragement from us to our, our farming community and our clients to, to insure the vehicle, but also to mitigate the, the fact that it could be stolen and then for to recover it. And, and certainly... Uh, th there is work that has gone on there, and, and there's a. I suppose, like if you look at the car industry, you know, if you buy a hundred thousand pound vehicle, the likelihood is it'll have an immobilizer and it'll have security alarms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That has not been the case with an agricultural machinery, but but that trend is slowly changing. <coughs> but there's still work to be done within that. MDS, sorry, <coughs> yeah, I've got Mr. Scott first, then yourself, Mr. Scott. Just to reinforce what Martin said. I mean. Uh, uh, my colleagues there are advising farmers about tracking devices and, and data tracking chips as well, and because that, that's absolutely crucial. Also, keeping an inventory of machinery, etc., as well, on, on, on the farm, and keeping things locked up as well. You know, so it's some basic things that we're advising on that would be important in securing your farm, and that's the advice that's going out from our from my colleagues. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, I just sorry to, to interrupt. Uh, in, you know, like crime prevention me measures, as a former crime prevention officer, I mean, you know, there is things like smart water that can put a unique uh, on uh, a high, you know, on a sort of high value piece of equipment. Smart water. smart water. It's like a chemical solution okay. that you can coat something with. Don't smile at me, Roger. I just tried to find out what it is. Did you know what smart water no, was? No, well, there you yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. Smart water. So th th there is a lot of measures that, that could be done in areas where you suspect that they are being targeted. Uh, so. Why are farmers not doing it if it's... If it's I, think, I think to be fair, they are doing it, just not enough of them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, there's certainly whenever you're buying larger value equipment, 
there's a greater incentive to, to have it tracked and to have seizure and to have tracking devices on them. Um, and there's a financial reward to do it in terms of the, the premium on the insurance policy. Um, but I, I still think that historically, in Scotland in particular, I mean, I can compare it to Ireland very specifically, but in Scotland there's been a reasonably low level of this, but the trend has been increasing, and therefore that's whenever, you know, do the thieves move with, with the crime, for want of a better word? So if they see an opportunity, is it easier to do it here than maybe in somewhere else? And that might be part of it as well. But certainly, as they begin to lose equipment and the impact hits them, yeah. then there's a greater trend towards using the other devices to mitigate the loss. Yes, sorry, my glasses. Yes, <laughs> <Let's do go. laughs> uh, I think as well, actually, just to again agree with what's been said, but the one thing we're seeing especially as well over the last year has been more members actually coming to us as an organisation and saying as well that they want to be involved in what's happening out there. They realise that this is not a problem that's going to go away, um, but what they want to do is actually work more together to actually raise awareness of it and to actually try and look at solutions. I mean, one of the things that we're seeing more of is some of these kind of local, they're being called rural watch, um, but it tends to be groups of farmers um, who are coming together. I've got another one um, within Renfrewshire, which was actually set up by Eldersley Estates. And I mean, more or less, what, they, where they, what happened with them was they came to me and said, we are being hit hard in the area. Um, we want to actually be able to do something about this ourselves, to share information, to try and actually stop it happening like further down the road so if they do see a vehicle that they don't think should be there they actually then contact their neighbours so it's a kind of like trying to kind of knock on effect and the other one as well that we're seeing a huge uptake in is we've been running as well a series of um rural security walk and talk events and these very much are aimed at getting the farmers and land managers out onto a farm to actually have a walk around, really simple, have a walk around, look at what's been done, look at the problem areas, we have the police along um, and what they tend to do as well is actually try and point out where the potential problems are and then come up with potential solutions and it also allows as well the farmers to actually get together to talk through what's been happening on the ground and share what they actually are doing and share information as well on the types of security systems, cameras, what's working and what's not working so we are seeing a huge increase in that type of, kind of localised activity. In, just on a slightly different topic, the kind of... Oh, well, I'll take DCS, Alan, yeah, on the okay. same thing first. Yeah, I was just going to reinforce the, the message that's coming across clear about the, the target hardening, for yeah. which is the expression we use about making it more difficult for people to steal from the farm. So that does... Inventories are really important because a lot of what we find as well, which makes investigations difficult, is there can be a considerable time lag in when it's actually identified that the property has gone missing. Farmer maybe doesn't use it for a period of weeks or months and then goes back. So the, the, that inventory and that continual checking just to make sure property is where it should be, it, it affords us a better opportunity to recover it and detect the crime. Security marking, whether that's with smart water or whatever, it, it is very important as well. And basically just the basic security measures. And I know the pack that went out in the, in the borders is, is, is been, we're probably going to roll that out across Scotland. It's a very good, clear pack as to what sort of, what farmers should be should be doing. The, the other bit on top of some of the, the, the farm watches or rural watches, that there have been a number of them across Scotland. Legacy force areas had their own ones in place. We're basically in the process of trying to work out which is the best options for us and what's the best fit for what, what area. The, the one that probably at the moment that we're looking very strongly at is a farm watch name division, which is a, an award winning one. They've got I think they got an NFU award for that, and it's a text alert one where any crime that's committed, everybody who's a member of that scheme gets a text straight away to say within your area, you get that. So that that's the sort of area, but I think we need to maybe broaden those out a fair bit and basically get that sort of engagement that we've been talking about here, that awareness and engagement for everybody that's potential victims of this type of crime, so they understand, is it a suspicious car? Has there been a farm that's lost equipment? Ooh, three was stuck in my mind because I don't have one, thankfully. Uh, that's it's what not I think. Be me. So the, the text alert one, as yeah. I say, that, that that's that's running up in uh, the Highlands division at the moment. And that seems to be quite a good one that we've got. I'm, I'm, now, plaintive looks, Margaret. I can't help it. So, uh, Roderick's still asking his question. 
Just, just, we'll, we'll come to it. Margaret, don't slip it in. Just, we'll come. <laughs> of course, I've got a lot of people waiting. Roderick, then I've got Christian and Gil, and then Jane, who've been very patient. And then I'll let you and Margaret, can have your... No, that's fine. Right. I shouldn't have let Roderick. Could I, could I just uh, switch the topic slightly as to kind of reasons why there seems to be such a substantial increase in livestock theft? Does someone care to speculate that, about that? Is it compared to kind of other criminality in society in general, why is, it, why is livestock theft increasing so much? I'll maybe just kick it off. And this is speculation, I think. Yeah. Um, I think when we've seen red meat prices rise in the last number of years, um, there's certainly been some evidence that, that is in, there's been an increase in cattle rustling as well. Uh, and I think Robert indicated around some of the meat plants, and I think there was a wee bit of so circumstantial evidence of saying that some going through back doors into different environments, into different restaurants, and possibly being sold directly at markets and things like that. So there's maybe been part of that as well, which has influenced that. Um, so that might be some of the reasons, but certainly I suppose it's like... From an insurance point of view, we see things that if something rises in value, then there becomes a market for it. And you see it with scrap metal. Whenever scrap metal rose in value, we've seen that theft of that increase. Red meat prices increased, and we've seen the corresponding rise in the cost of, or the increase in livestock rustling. Okay. Jane, you wanted a supplementary, and this will be your question. My question, Dr. Smith mentioned earlier food fraud. And just following on from what Roderick said, I mean, the food industry is so regulated. If there's a lot of livestock going missing, then it, 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 there must, it seems to me there must be some illicit means of processing that, those, that livestock before it turns up at the restaurant. And I, I was just wondered if there was any evidence of that, uh, that infrastructure, that shadow infrastructure that would support that sort of activity. Abattoirs springs to mind. I think we should have a meat inspection <laughs> here as well. Yes, Mr Smart. Just to go on from that, I think that there's a perception that there's, over the last few years with the downturn, there's possibly been a lot of people who have been working in the industry before who may have a bit of spare time on their hand. Um, the animal disappears and they've got the expertise to, to kill and butcher it. It's obviously animal welfare issues as well. It's animal welfare and, and I think Food safety. Food safety, yeah. yeah. Uh, both. Um, is that connected up in any way by the police, or do you liaise with these other agencies, food safety and so on? Trade and standards, and I know a couple of investigations are ongoing just now in relation to cattle fraud specifically. Uh, for it to come out of that environment to the police, it does need to be very much at the kind of criminal fraud kind of side of it. This meat, the stolen meat or however it meat's getting back into the food chain would be more down to the food agencies, I would say. But if we can create those links as to the stolen livestock going in that way, then, yeah, we would be very much you involved in it. You say, if we can create those links, you don't have them then? I, I Personally, no, I am not aware of that at the moment. Uh, and, and as I say, I think everybody that's spoken about this so far has been speculating as to that okay. being a method by which it, 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 the, the disposal of the stolen livestock has been. Christian. Thank you very much, Convina. Uh, but that comes, my question comes a bit uh, of what has been talked about, about uh, food, uh, food crime. Uh, to a certain extent, uh, organised crimes have always been very good at, uh, at getting involved in the food industry. And particularly, uh, I would like to know, because the clarification today, it seems to me, that apart from some isolated incident, uh, that organised crimes are the main reason why we've got an increase on, on the rural crime just now. What I would like to know is, if it's the case, uh, what can we do better on regulations? Uh, we talked about manufacturers, but there may be a responsibility for this parliament, maybe responsibility for some organisation to, to working differently. Uh, I remember being uh, myself victim of food crime was, was to do with number plates. Now, uh, we know that in this country number plates of traders uh, haven't got a distinct number plates. Should we change maybe that rules? Uh, in Aberdeenshire, I know that a lot of, uh, uh, of these very expensive machineries have been very well protected, but the organised thieves now are going after the um, hydraulic arms. 
and there is a big, a big, a big search on 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 stealing part of the uh, of the of the of the expensive machinery. So, is there a way we could maybe uh, having a number put on them or making sure that they can be re resold? So, I I would like to to have some ideas how we can help on number plates on hydraulic arms or anything else. I think, I think, yes. That would be to do with the National Plant Register. I mean, there is already a National Plant Register, and uh, but as to whether specific parts of a machine are numbered separately, I, I very much doubt it. But, uh, the, you know, any plant stolen in the UK should be reported to the National Plant Register, uh, who tries to share... This just like that other water you were talking about, smart water. What what goes on the national plant register? Is it going when the the, the vehicles first? It's new, like um, registering your ownership of a vehicle. How does that work? I think there's. I think you can register it prior to uh, that. But I mean, a lot of it, it thefts of tractors and plant would be reported to. I think it's P N I U Panu. What it stands for, I've forgotten. But uh, so there is a scheme where, and I mean, they work with the NFU and with the police and tr and pass on intelligence regarding things. But uh, you know, if somebody's taking part of a machine, you know, it, it would probably not be st stamped with a chassis number or a so. You know. Explain about this national plant register. Are all vehicles on it, or what? Sto stolen vehicles. What we would do, stolen. Is we, and, and it's a way of if we do have a suspicion about a vehicle, we can very quickly check whatever identifying marks are on that vehicle against the register to establish whether they're stolen or not. What, what's right now is the problem would be is if the, the whole piece of equipment's not stolen and they've taken a bit off it, and none of the identifying marks are on the piece that was stolen. Now, that might be that we need to identify is there a specific part of a machinery going just now, in which case we do need to look at some form of covert marking on that piece so that when the, when the plant's on the farm, it's got the chassis number on it, but also certain parts, the more expensive parts of it, also have this covert marking on it, UV, smart water, whatever we want to put on it, so that you've got a chance of getting that back. So if it's just one part of it, albeit it could be lots of, lots of money, but if there's no identifying marks on it, that's very difficult eh, for us to do. But again, another option is that when, when farmers are doing their itinerary of some of their equipment, it's not enough just to write down, well, I've got a plough, this is the number of it. Very individual identifying marks that are on that plough are also good to note down as well, so that... It's, that I, no, no, but, but, cuttings. But, I mean, but, the they're, 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 they're not all pristine and in perfect condition. <laughs> they will all have their their, their, their nicks and their, and their, yes. their, their bumps and their, and basically what you'd be looking for was even though we recover a part of a, a a part of equipment with no identifying marks on it, but it could be that the farmer actually can go and say, well, actually, that that scratch on it there and the bump there, and, and that's the sort of information that we've got as well. So you can still marry it up to, to the piece of equipment that was stolen. So the itinerary is real. I would really stress that. I know I've said it a couple of times. An itinerary equipment on the farm is really important, but we're very, very specific details on that, which helps for the recovery <coughs> down the line. Mr Smart, you were... I'm just thinking that my plough might get new marks quite regularly, which can make it very difficult. But <laughs> we as an industry do have a, a lot to... To have catch up to do with this, um, but just I'm, I'm going to take this back a wee bit. I've, I've been looking through my papers during the discussion, just to let you all know how serious this is. At one of our local branch meetings in December, they took a show of hands at, at the end of it. They'd, they'd had the rural community officer in giving them a talk, and at the end of the meeting, by a show of hands. Between 70 and 75 per cent of the people there said they'd been subject to crime in the previous 12 months. I don't know. But that, I would say that's, that's quite representative of how widespread this is. So, but we, it, it is very difficult for us to mark our machinery because it does come to pieces so easily. Mm -hmm. Coming back to Christian. Yeah, I, I, I just
just wanted to, to, to point out that as we talk about manufacturer, it's, it's the not a way we can have manufacturer marking all the expensive parts with zero number, with, with something, but we do that with cars. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I can't see why it, it wouldn't be possible. Well, that's an issue that we can perhaps yeah. find out by raising with the manufacturers here to, to raise with the manufacturing industry. Yeah, I, I've heard that. Uh, uh, yes, sorry. I'll suspend while you sort it. Yes. So you, when did you start having trouble? might write to manufacturers and indeed to other uh, agencies such as the um, meat inspectors and so on with any of the issues when we look back over the evidence session we can discuss that in another meeting and now move on to Gil please Can I come from the automotive industry and almost everything in that area almost everything every part of the car has got a serial number in it and in trucks and so forth so I'm kind of surprised that a tractor, uh, I would imagine that it would be manufactured in a similar way, not the kind of branded name, but parts would come in and they would all be, they would all have numbers on them that would tell you wh where they were manufactured and when they were manufactured, so just for the record. Um, but um, uh, there was two, two uh, uh, comments made about a uh, CCT uh, uh, in use, but I'm just wondering how extensive it's used uh, in, a, in a farm setting. An idea that you've got half a million, I mean, in, in a, an urban situation, if somebody had half a million quids worth of equipment lying about uh, outside or in an unlocked barn, uh, I'm sure they would have some kind of protection. So I, it, it sounds to me if things like that are getting lifted, then, you know, that, that would be a way to protect. But I just wonder how extensive, maybe from Mr Malone, he could maybe have uh, information on in, in that. Any specific figures in terms of the numbers of farms that would have CCTV in operation? Um, certainly from an insurance perspective, it, imp it improves the risk, let's put it like that. So as part of our assessment of the risk that we would be taking on board or we insure, um, the use of CCTV cameras and any other security equipment would be something that we would reflect in terms of the, the underwriting premium we charge the customer. But I wouldn't have any figures in terms of the percentages. Is a range of discounts you get if you. Well, for you example, know, tracker, for example, uh, tracking devices on vehicles, it goes up to 27.5%, which is quite significant. <coughs> um, CTV, do you have different rates? There'll be different, different rates off the top of my head. I'm not sure no. what the rate is for CCTV so cameras. Chance to, chance to yeah, advertise no, I, here, I, you know? Yeah, you about that. We look at all these things slightly differently, and there's a range of stuff, but, but certainly we would reflect it. Yes. I mean, it could be as much as 20% discount for having CTV cameras and proper security around it. 
Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Smart, do you want to come in from the farming perspective and use of CCTV? And it can be difficult to fit in a meaningful way. Yes, you can have CCTV, but you know, where, where do you put your recording equipment? Because uh, I know I, I looked into it for my yard, and to get a decent system in would have been a huge job because it's just so far to take the, the signal back to the, the house, so it can be difficult. We have to look at all these things, but there are other, maybe simpler ideas out there, and it's all about deterrent. Geese. Yeah. Right. Llamas, we read that. Geese Until and they steal them. Not together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ms. Dougal. Um, actually, off the back of that. Well, and I think it was just mentioned was broadband coverage um, and mobile phone coverage. One of the things that we are hearing more from members now is that they are looking at these, I think it's called second tier security systems whereby it would be like a remote system that would be set up to allow the farmer access that if somebody is within his steading when they shouldn't be, it would send like a text message or similar to them when they're out working in the fields. Um, but if you don't actually have the network coverage to start with, you, I mean, there's not even any point in looking at the system at the moment. CCTV, or security. Right, um, Margaret, do you have a question or yes? Yeah, um, the network coverage was covered, but I mean, uh, there was a, an article I think in the Scottish Farmer, December two thousand and fourteen, where South Lanarkshire said it was reaching breaking point, uh, the increased levels of crime, and they felt under siege. So I wonder if there's an issue around the actual recording. Um, of crimes themselves, and that seems to be suggested from the NFU paper. Rural crime is such a, a big area. Should we be calling it rural crime and then all these different aspects maybe ticking the box to get the true extent? Because I think the feeling was, while well, crime, we're told, is going down, that's certainly not what... Um, the, the people in South Lanarkshire were feeling when they were saying they felt it was in this uh, particular farmer any school brides experience at a 31 year high. So is there an issue around that and would a definition of rural crime help to record it better and therefore to assess the, the true extent and deal with it? Well, we're looking at you there. Yes, Alan, so. Re recording a crime, my only concern with, it, with where we're going with this is if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority and if, if you it is acquisitive crime. There are thieves out there stealing property from industrial estates, from farms, from everywhere. And, and, and basically, there's an onus in the police to investigate all of those. So if we, now, what I've said to you is at the start, what we went in, and we can very easily go in and identify what crimes are from, what locations, and it's, and it's easy enough for us to, to do that. And for like of Lanarkshire, between 13-14 until 14-15, there's an increase from between 91 and 107. So that's just the sort of numbers that we're talking about within that area. To actually to categorise it as a separate crime entity, to, to what end are we, are we then going to do anything different than what we'd be doing just now? Or is there any expectation that Police Scotland would do something because it's got a rural badge on it now? I think we need to make sure that we give that service to everybody within the community and, and I think we should still be doing that whether it's categorised as rural rural or not but the, the current crime recording mechanism I've got does allow us to pick out those that are on farms and as far as the, 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 the numbers are concerned there is a Scottish crime recording standard that everybody that reports a crime to us it's checked against that standard to ensure a crime has been committed and I'm quite comfortable because I'm in charge of that part of Police Scotland as well the, the, the figures that we've got of what are reflective of what has been reported to us. Christian, you yeah, want I to... I just want to uh, superintend this one. Uh, are we more concerned then about the, the people who are committing the crimes, the organised crimes, that we are concerned about the type of crime? Because do, have, we, have we already uh, identified as organised groups, organised crimes, cr criminals are, are targeting not only rurals, but others as well? Yeah, and that, that's what I spoke about earlier <coughs> on, about us taking that step up and looking across. An organised crime group will not just steal tractors. An organised crime group will, will commit significant crime right across the board. So we need to target those people as well as doing the initial inquiries correctly as well, no matter what that crime is. Well, we've already had a 
session with yeah. SEPA and about serious organised crime and environmental agencies having to... Just a small point from the two that were made there as well. I mean, we understand as well today's session was on agricultural crime, but that also does take into account as well the crimes that not only are committed on smaller farms, but also on larger estates. Um, and I mean, to add into that, I mean, you've then, you are looking as well at your environmental crime, and this is as well including farms, but also your fly tipping, your littering, your damage interference to traps and well, snares. Well, yeah. that, that's what, what we did really in our session with SEPA to some extent. We tried to mm -hmm. focus on acquisitive for this particular session? It was just from the point of view that it would then be very difficult to actually categorise rural yes, crime yes, because yes, it is so wide. Yes. Well, uh, oh, sorry, Margaret, yes. No, no there you are. <laughs> no, don't encourage her. Don't <laughs> encourage her. <laughs> and just lastly, is there um, any incidents of intimidation? We're hearing that more and more from farmers, that they do feel intimidated if they speak out against any aspect of, of crime, acquisitive, etc. Mr Smart, let's start with you. I have been threatened on the farm. Now I'm only half a mile from the town. And uh, it, it was a wildlife crime incident. And when I challenged the, the person, I was told in no uncertain terms that if I reported it to the police, I would probably have a large fire in the shed. These so it's, and it's, it's terrifying when yes. we, we are out in the open. We do have large areas. We can't put a fence around a whole lot. And you suddenly think, well, if I do report this to the police, what's going to happen? Yeah. And I must say, in that instance, I took the mobile phone out and showed the chap me dialing 999. Mm -hmm. But it's, 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 it was a big worry for the next course, few weeks. And your family. DCS Allen. I would always advocate that, as well as reporting the crime, if there's any intimidation on the back of that crime, that also requires to be investigated. Yeah. So it needs to be reported to us. And if we can not only detect the, the initial crime, but obviously it's, it's, it's a much a more serious, in a lot of occasions, when, when they go towards intimidation and doing sort of things that we've just heard, then absolutely that should be reported to, to Police Scotland in order that we investigate that thoroughly as well and basically bring bring people to book for that too. I'm going to add um, to uh, what Chief Superintendent Allen has said, that although there's no definition of agricultural crime, um, all the, the types of situations and, and crimes that people have been talking about around the table um, you know, we, we will be able to prosecute these where there is sufficient available evidence, um, but it, it won't be under the, the banner of agricultural no, crime, no. be under the banner of theft. Mm -hmm. There are things that we can do where we have evidence that are linked to serious and organised crime. We can add statutory aggravations. Um, so although we don't have clear evidence that it is serious and organised crime, we, 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 we can add a statutory... We don't have corroborated evidence. We can add the statutory aggravation. Um, and there's all sorts of contraventions of lots of statutory offences um, across the across all the different types of legislation in terms of food safety, in terms of livestock, etc. So there is there is there is there is a lot of law out there and a lot of criminal offences that all of these types of mm -hmm. circumstances fall under, but they are not badged agricultural or rural crime, so to speak. Mr Scott, I think you were yeah, yeah, our unit uh, had a look at uh, the number of th farm thefts, you know, from the information we've got, and this is they've looked at in comparison with total thefts, excluding shopping thefts, and basically the, of of the thefts of these thefts, uh, farm thefts was six percent in 2012-13, and that's from 1st of February to 1st of January for each of these years. 13.1% for 2013-14 and 6.9% 2014-15. Now, that 6.9% for 2014-15 equates to 62 thefts. So, yeah, and at 60, so it's 62 th two farm thefts and uh, there's 835 other thefts excluding shopping. So that gives you a proportion, or, or, or indication of what the proportion is. But in saying that, the value of, of, of thefts has increased because there's been a lot of higher value thefts of equipment. So there's uh, an increase uh, over the three years in terms of value of thefts, but uh, overall value of thefts, but uh, you know, th that's the proportions we're talking about in the Scottish borders. But that doesn't mean, to, but these low proportions don't in any way reflect the fact in these 
communities, it's such a, a it's a big thing. You know, it obviously affects the, their business, it affects the community around them, and people are very much aware of that. But that gives you an idea of what the situation is like in the borders. You weren't waving at me, Gil, were you? No, you want... Yes. I'm well, just wondering what Crane in general in the country said. Is, is it sporadic or is it persistent? Uh, and the reason I raise that, I live in the countryside, and since I've lived there, that's now just going on about 17 years, there's been incidents where cars, high end value cars, have been targeted, but not all the time. They come, it's about every four years they come, and they target the car, they steal it, and I don't know of any single car that's been brought. They might come and steal three cars take them away. So how difficult is that to detect? And I haven't heard of a single cab being uh, uh, returned. But that's, it's, it's, it's from households, I've got to say, but in the countryside. There's bits of that relevant, given what we were talking about earlier on with tractors. I mean, the, the method by yeah. which people steal cars now has completely changed because they need the key, so they need to break into the house to get the key to steal the car. And that's obviously not where we are with tractors. We, 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 the one key doing multiple uh, tractors, etc. What, what, what I would say is crime in general, as we've already said, is, is kind of on a, a, downward, uh, a downward trend. That's not to say that at various times there will be spikes. I mean, that's, it depends who's out at the time, who's active, what intelligence we've got, what we've been able to disrupt, what we haven't been able to disrupt. There are always going to be spikes within that overall trend. That, and, if, and where they are, if, if we knew exactly where that spike was going to be at any one time, it would be brilliant. It would be uh, better than what we are. You talked about liaising south of the border. What about with European uh, police forces? Yep. Um, uh, give us a little bit about that with regard to um, agricultural theft. We, we have got a, a Police Scotland officer embedded within Europol um, who has our link into them for, and, and there are obviously officers from down south in Europol, and there's a, a kind of UK uh, <coughs> element to, to Europol, but we, we're, we've absolutely, we've gone to the, and, and taking, the, taking the decision to embed an officer right in there so that we've got that direct linkage in when we do start to, to find some transportation of some of our stolen property turning up in Poland, etc. You can then start to create the, the links you need with the local law enforcement in those areas to try and do something at that end. And is it being successful? It's certain, what I would say is that the, the processes that are in place now are much better than ever were. They're much more streamlined, so yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, on that point, I'm going to end this evidence session. Can I say thank you very much? It was extremely, extremely interesting. Uh, and uh, I think what we'll do as a committee uh, is, when we come to our work programme in a couple of weeks, decide where we take this forward. Obviously, there's some correspondence we can do, and perhaps take further evidence. This uh, evidence will be out on the official report the 25th. Tomorrow, So you'll be able to see again the evidence that was given. And if there's anything that sitting around the table you now wish that you had said, um, don't, feel free to write uh, to me as convener for, for the distribution to committee members. But anything else that you didn't bring to our attention, having revised and looked through the evidence, it says, well, I want to add this bit now. It would be very helpful. Thank you very much. I'm going to suspend for, do you want 10 minutes break for the next round table? Thank you very much. That was an OK from Margaret. That's an OK from me. I suspend for 10 minutes. <laughs>
Right. Uh, item four on the agenda uh, team. It's another roundtable evidence session, this time the Prisoners Control Release Scotland Bill. And the purpose of this session is to allow participants, many of whom have already given evidence to the committee, to comment on the Cabinet Secretary's recent letter indicating the Scottish Government will bring forward proposals at stage two, which will potentially significantly alter the bill. Copies of the letter were circulated with the committee papers, and I welcome each participant to this session. I'm going to wave going round the table because I think we know pretty well the organisations you represent. Uh, each of you have a copy of the plan in your desk, and I'm just going to go straight. Who's not done a round table in Parliament before? Some, right. It's like school, isn't it? Um, all, all the, all the, really, it is a matter for really interaction between yourselves as witnesses with the, uh, the committee members playing a, a lesser role in it, though they will come in with questions. But really, it's a, a, a more efficient way sometimes to, to get evidence. So just if you just indicate to me, then I'll take your name and I'll call out the list of those who are waiting uh, to um, participate. So, can I have anybody who wants to start with Professor Tata? Well, just to say that I got very excited, convener, when you said that. Well, that's was... enough. We'll just stop you. There. <laughs> <laughs> Don't spoil it now. <laughs> when you said that there was a, a plan in front of each of us, and I thought, oh, this will be the plan for what we're going to do. <laughs> and then, of course, I see it's the seating plan. And just to say that, um, you know, this is this would be one of the most far-reaching changes for a good 20 years to the system of release. That is not to say there shouldn't be change, but I think we really need to think about this much more carefully. There needs to be proper consultation and a proper process. It's worrying that this would be brought in at stage two. My feeling is, and I think maybe the feeling of others, that it's rather late. We need a proper, systematic thought about it uh, and proper consultation. Did anyone else wish to come in? Yes, Professor McNeill. Mainly just to agree, but also to suggest that the, the timing is uh, important in the sense that um, most sentencing scholars um, and most scholars of reintegration would agree that you can't look at release in isolation from sentencing. You, you know, if it was yeah. hospital management, you have to think about discharge and admissions at the same time. And um, given that the it's recently been announced that the Sentencing Council will be established and operational this year. It seems to make sense to me to at least um, pause and consider the possibility of consultation with the Sentencing Council in relation to the, the connection between what we sometimes refer to as front door sentencing, the sending no, no. in and back door sentencing, which refers to the, the release mm. arrangements. So I think, I think the committee appreciates, appreciates this very strong connection. Um, Miss Gailey, you were nodding there. Don't nod, you see her come to you. It makes you, fl <laughs> makes you a target. Can you have uh, the microphone, uh, please? Uh, mm -hmm. our, our perspective uh, in this was, is from the angle of risk uh, and, and public protection. And for that reason, um, some of the changes that were referred to or alluded to in, in, in the Cabinet Secretary's letter appeared to be relevant to that. But... From, from that perspective, I also think, going back to what Professor Tata was saying, that I think there is a need to actually understand the particular individuals and cases that are causing the concern be, be, be behind, behind this policy move. So I think, in addition to, there's also a need for scoping about the numbers, the characteristics, the circumstances that lead to concern so that the resources can be targeted at the right group. Anybody else wish to come at this stage? Mr McKendrick. Well, really, it's probably just to keep comments to date and just maybe take uh, both of them because they're slightly separate, just in relation to that process of consultation. The committee will know that we're currently evaluating MAPA, and whilst the detail of how we might manage these individuals yeah. post-release is, 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 is uh, far from clear, it's quite reasonable to assume that we'll require a multi-agency approach to managing those individuals. So that uh, MAPA evaluation is currently ongoing, and it may be wise <coughs> to see the lessons learned from that in terms of uh, rolling that practice uh, considerations into how we might manage uh, the, these group of offenders. So I think that that's also quite important. And I just also want to endorse the position around about uh, the focus on risk and risk management and the importance of professionals 
from a variety of uh, of, of uh, professional disciplines, understanding the requirement to understand individual risk and understand risk management plans that mitigate those risks. So my contribution was, was around about confirming the two statements that have have been made to date. When is the map a um, review or whatever you can't you know was, could come to some conclusions? Uh, the date for the. Uh, Annual report. Sorry, the date for the national report should be around summer time of the of this year. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Mc Professor McKendrick McNeil. Sorry. That's okay. Just on the with the tie on, I would assume you would get the McNeil straight away, but never mind. Um, <laughs> on the on the point of risk. Uh, sorry, but so you said when my back was turned. It's the, it's the ancient the McNeil of Collinsy. Oh, so I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm anyway, not au fait with the anyway, McNeil tartan. Never mind. I will small, remedy this Small tonight. but important point. <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, it's a big point. You've made a big issue of it. Go ahead, Professor. <laughs> on the question of, I don't know. This on, is a bad day. Go on. On the question of risk, I think <laughs> it's important to, to be clear. Release arrangements effectively change the extent or the, the duration for which you choose to, to, to use a crude expression, you choose to store the risk. But the release arrangement, um, in terms of the timing of the release in and of itself, doesn't necessarily do much to mitigate risk. So if you want to invest in risk reduction and thereby in public safety. That's about the way that you configure uh, your, your prison regimes, but it's also about the way that you configure your post-release support. And it, it, taking a, a, a rough estimate of 400 additional prison places to accommodate um, the numbers in this case, and we think that that's a conservative estimate, that at 40,000 per place per annum is costing you £16 million. Um, yeah. You'd have to be pretty sure that that investment was buying you um, improvements in public safety um, and I don't think storing risk for longer buys you improvements in public safety so that's my caution on that. Thank you. Ms McKenzie followed by Mr White. Yes I just wanted to echo um, the comments so far I mean that there, there are two concerns that we have one is that there was and the Law Society made this point in their submission that there was no evidence gathering exercise carried out prior to the legislation being uh, mooted um, early last year. Um, in fact, they go as far as to say there's no solid empirical basis for the proposals, and I think we would, we would echo that. My goodness, that's a bombshell there. <laughs> On go, yes. Well, let, let's be sure, as, as, as uh, Professor McNeil said, don't, I mean, don't we owe it to the public to be sure of our ability to, to deliver on the policy objectives stated in the um, initial memorandum um, if we're going to go ahead with this, given the potential increased cost of the public person. It's not just increasing the number of prison places. Potentially, you might be opening up the um, increased numbers of legal cases being taken if you have more people in prison who <coughs> cannot access rehabilitative programs, and we know that the offer on that is already not adequate. Then what you might find is, and we made this point in our initial submission, people are making claims of arbitrary detention. I want to prove that I'm not a risk, but I cannot prove I'm not a risk, and therefore I'm being detained arbitrarily. But also, uh, another concern I've had in, in our most recent submission, the point I made was that um, we're sitting here today discussing what you said quite rightly at the beginning, something that will potentially significantly alter the bill on the basis of a two-page letter. I mean, I was struck by going through the submissions that all I had was more unanswered questions. Have the judiciary been consulted? They're a key stakeholder. We don't know. Um, what impact will be on the prison population? SPS says it will need more resources. How much money is being set aside for that? Prison is expensive. Um, what's the likely cost of public purse in the totality? We don't know. Um, we don't know about this guaranteed period of supervision. Will it be tagged onto the end of a full custodial sentence? Will it be incorporated? Yes. There's so many unanswered questions. And in some ways, it concerns me that you're sort of moving towards your stage one report without any of that detail in an updated policy I memorandum. Worry about the committee. I think these questions were in the committee's heads as well okay. when, when okay. you've raised some of them. You've added some more, but certainly I'm sure other committee members, particularly how you can move forward without looking at sentencing as well and mm -hmm. what is meant by when does this period of supervision kick in yep. during the sentence or post the sentence. You know, the, the, I think we're all aware of those. Mr White. Thank you. <clears throat> I think that the way the discussion is going so far fits very much with the point of view that we have. And I think that the idea of taking time to work this out in a coherent way rather than a piecemeal way would be tremendously helpful. And I think that to draw things together um, and to look at the whole picture right from the point at which somebody is arrested right through to their release um, and whatever, diversions from prosecution and diversions from custody, I think there's a huge amount that we can do in there. And if we tie it all together, we can come up with something that will work properly for the individuals involved and also fit with what the SPS seek to do. And society. Yes. Ms Crombie. 
Um, whilst we recognise and acknowledge the previous comments made, then obviously Victim Support Scotland would look at it from a victim's perspective. Um, and we actually support the ending of automatic early release and the extension to all long-term prisoners and support the period of post-release supervision for prisoners. Um, the, the reason we believe that um, this works towards greater clarity, transparency and for victims and the wider community to actually understand sentencing better. Um, from our experiences, a lot of victims don't currently understand. They don't understand what part is custodial and what part is served in the community. And what we would like to work towards is something that is, provides more clarity to them. Does anybody else want to come in from Mr March? Do you want to come in there? Um. I think what we're discussing to some extent are the unknown unknowns, but there's also known knowns in terms of, of the discussion around the bill. Um, on Friday last week, the Scottish Prison Service had 7,475 people in custody in Scotland. Um, we had 318 on HDC, giving a total of 7,793 in custody. Um, we have a current population, a current design capacity of around 8,000 and we have housed significantly more. So there is some argumentation currently which is not based on, on the fact of what we can actually house whilst we're in custody. Uh, I think the second um, issue that I'd want to raise is that the Scottish Prison Service is not paid on the basis of cost per prisoner place um, and that uh, there are additional costs that we are trying to work out. Um, those costs are based upon a small proportion of individuals potentially being motivated to take on programmes further to um, 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 moving through a parole process rather than being liberated. That will actually not be a huge number, but we're still trying to work our way through what those numbers actually mean for, for our organisation. I think the final thing I would say is this is actually, we've estimated from Scottish Government figures around 410 at the end of a 12-year process. So it would start two years from now and it would conclude in terms of numbers if Scottish Government figures are right with 410 additional in custody um, 12 years after that was, was allocated. So those are some of the knowns around the system. Um, I'm happy for people to discuss the unknowns. Professor McNeill. Well, I mean, on, on that, I would just say that, that it may take 12 years to get to the point of having to spend the extra £16 million, but then you have to keep on spending it um, because your, your, your overall increase in the, in the prison population works through the system um, and, and you're left with larger capacity needs than existed before because of a legislative change which isn't based on an evidence um, base around public safety as, as far as I'm concerned. But I wanted to pick up on Sarah's point. I, I, I agree that there's a problem uh, about clarity and truth in sentencing and that the current, um, the current arrangements don't sufficiently explain or make clear to the public or to victims of crime or indeed to um, people who are sentenced for offences what the effect and meaning of the sentence is. So when, a, when, when something which is currently called a custodial sentence is passed, something much more complicated happens, which is that people are required to submit to a range of different forms of penal control, uh, some part of which is custodial, some part of which is community-based. And in fact, to meet the objectives of sentencing, the purposes of sentencing effectively, those elements need to be combined. It's not possible to, to do the rehabilitative and reintegrative part of the punishment effectively unless there is a properly designed um, and properly resourced community part. So I think um, for that reason I, I, I agree with Sarah's point. I think that a change in the language, a change in the way that these arrangements are described is critically important to enhancing public understanding and public acceptability but that's not the same thing as actually changing the arrangements. Um, uh, Mr White. <coughs> Just said, I think that clarity in sentencing is a... Fergus, Pete, you're all cosy in here. I don't know. Yes, uh, Mr White. <laughs> thank, thank you, Ms Graham. <laughs> <laughs> Convener. <clears throat> I think that the, the idea of recalibrating sentencing so that when a sentence is announced in, or laid down in court, when that, that actually relates to a real time 
rather than something that has been chopped and changed around. I think that would be very helpful indeed. I think it would be helpful for everybody involved, from the, per from the perpetrator, from the person who is being convicted, mm -hmm. through for the victims as well. I think there's a huge amount of clarity required, and we have the potential to join this together and come up with something that is coherent, <coughs> which at the moment it is not. Ms McKenzie. I was just going to say um, that I, I also have sympathy with the view that there's a real lack of clarity and transparency in sentencing, but that's not how this bill is being advanced. It's being advanced on the basis that it's going to improve public safety. One of the stated policy objectives is not to improve clarity in sentencing. No, but that it's an interesting point to make as well while mm -hmm. we're, we're considering yeah. it. Christian. You're next. Thank you. Mr. Uh, and, Followed by uh, Lane. There's been very, very interesting points uh, been raised, and which have not been raised when, when people came into first in the inquiry. One particular question I will have is regarding the spirit of the bill and how it was uh, put forward in a stage manner to uh, try to sh uh, end automatic early release for, for all, all offenders. And I think that was welcomed by, by, by Sarah Crumby, for example. But how we... Are we changed from the view uh, that we had before, which means that uh, uh, we don't accept around this table that a stage approach should be accepted? Uh, because I, I don't remember here that, that at, at, at when you came to give us uh, 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 your, your views, uh, uh, we heard a lot about how the stage was maybe uh, too small or maybe not safe enough. And now we've got the government is coming, uh, maybe a too big a step for, for, for some. But uh, I just want your views on should we have a step by step approach or should we stop the step by step approach altogether and consider everything on a whole? Do you want to come yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm to, um... In an ideal world, one would look at the whole thing together. I mean, there, I think um, Victim Support made the point in its submission that. Um, you know, why, I may be wrong there, why look only at the long-term prisoners? I have some sympathy for that. So, yes, um, if you are really looking at this seriously, look at the whole thing, and indeed the Sentencing Commission back in 2005 <coughs> produced its report on uh, release, um, which also noted there would need to be recalibration of sentencing, and it did that. It, uh, it looked at the whole thing. Unfortunately, the Custodial Sentences and Weapons Bill is introduced, then kind of made a bit of a hash, really, of, uh, of the Commission's report then. But yes, ideally, I think one would want that. One would want to look at it systematically. The problem is, of course, we just don't know. We've got two laudable aims. That's all they are. And, and the big question is, how do you combine these two things? It's, you're trying to, one's trying to square the circle. One's just left, as Miss McKenzie said, with more questions than answers. If somebody else wants to come in, you have to indicate to me. I can't, I'm not, yes, just Professor quick, McNeil. A quick observation. I mean, I'm open-minded on the question of um, reforming arrangements for short-term prisoners. Um, there are sort of pragmatic reasons why it kind of makes sense for those um, to be processed in a slightly more automated way. Um, but on the other hand, the, the, we have a problem in Scotland, which is that those serving less than four years have no automatic entitlement uh, to, or rather they're not subject to forms of post-release support and supervision. Um, and they are often at the highest risk of re-offending, even if not necessarily at the highest risk of, or likely to cause very serious public harm. So if you, if you take the, the 16 million figure which I've used, that would uh, roughly triple the budget of the Scottish Government's change fund, which is a recent initiative to try to enhance support through public social partnerships to that specific population. I think that would be a massively more effective investment in public safety than spending 16 million on, on 400 new prison places. I think we, we were aware of the fact there isn't that mandatory statutory support for sentences less than four years. I think it's an issue we've raised regularly in this parliament. Now, who's next in the witnesses before I move on to another committee member? Have you, Christ, Mr. White? I, I, I just wanted to know if Well, Mr. White wanted in, then oh, I'll no, take Christian. I'm, 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 uh, okay, Christian, yes. Uh -huh. I, I want to repeat something I said at the previous um, committee, which is that within this bill, there is this part where governors can decide to release uh, prisoners one or two days prior to the end of their sentence. And I'm, as I've mentioned before, it's very important that whatever happens with the rest of this bill, no. that this, this move is made available. I think we're all now. happy about that bit. I don't think that's really I'm a, delighted that you're happy. Thank you. <laughs> 
Yeah, we're not, yeah, we're content, perhaps. But okay, I think that's not you. the issue. The other issue, of course, is the changes that have been made and yeah. in Christian. Yeah, I just wanted to have clarity on this. Uh, are, are people around the table are against automatic uh, early, uh, the, the ending of automatic early uh, release or not? I, I'm, I'm not against changing how it's described, <laughs> but I'm absolutely in favour of the fact that uh, when a sentence is passed in the court, that should involve both. Uh, when, it, when, it, when the judge determines that it's essential that somebody, for reasons of justice, serves a custodial sentence, then they should serve a custodial sentence, and they should be supported and supervised on release in order to ensure their reintegration. That's both a matter of public safety and it's a matter of rights, because they they should be restored to a position where they can contribute as a citizen effectively uh, in the same way that we're all expected to. And, and the experience of imprisonment is, and Pete can speak to this um, better than I can, that the release phase is, the, is in many respects the most difficult yes. phase. And if we don't get it right and yeah. give people the support that they need to make a contribution to society, then we'll all suffer the consequences. So combining a custodial part with a community part where guaranteed support is made available makes very good sense to me. Um, how we describe that, I think it's unhelpful that we've described it historically as automatic release. It was even more unhelpful when we called it un automatic unconditional release because it wasn't unconditional. Mm -hmm. um, and it led to poor, um, no, I was going to be rude about the previous political discussions around us. I think it, there was poor policy making because there was a reaction to political debate about um, an, a, a set of arrangements that were not poorly conceived in the way that they operated, but poorly presented to the public. And these are two completely separate issues. Yes, yes. So the truth and sentencing issue is an important issue for public confidence. It actually has very little to do with the question of public safety. And so the, the way it's described is really important. Um, but for public safety reasons and for reasons of, of reintegration as a, as a right, it's critical that we have a system which combines um, custodial sentences with post-release support. Can I just ask you to, if you, you mentioned part the, the sentence should be custodial and a community part. Mm -hmm. So it's all embraced within, as it were, a sentence, a sentence of sorts. How would you technically put that into legislation so that the courts would... And would the courts at that time, in, in declaring the sentence, have to at that time say you will serve X years uh, as custodial and so many as um, community, or would it be more flexible? Well, there's, there's two systems um, that, that immediately come to mind. You could have a system where, I'll, I'll roll back, in many continental jurisdictions you have a, a, a situation where an initial judge, a judge at first instance, says the punishment that you deserve for this crime is 10 years. And then the case is passed to what's called an implementation judge, or I'll do my French, a juge d'application de peine, oh. whose job is to say how... Uh, well, <laughs> it's, the, it's the old alliance. Um, <laughs> the, the, the JAP, to use the shorthand, then determines what's the best way to ah. execute or to implement this sentence. And the, that judicial figure has the authority to determine uh, the point of release and the conditions of release. So they have what is currently in our system a function fulfilled by the parole board. Mm -hmm. um, and because they are judicial authorities, they have due process protections and they are compliant with the European Convention on Human Rights. That's their mechanism for dealing with it. So the, in that system, you don't necessarily specify at first instance how the, the split in the yeah. sentence between the custodial part and the community part will, will work out. That allows you to incentivise the person in prison to cooperate yeah, with yeah. the regime and to participate in the way that our parole system is intended to, but it retains a judicial involvement in determining what the meaning of a judicially imposed sentence is. And I think for that reason, that, that system has merit. A parole system, parole systems function in many common law jurisdictions, and they function relatively well to protect public safety and to help with these deliberations about the correct moment of release. But they are bedeviled by the problem that they can't express clearly and simply what the sentence means. Okay. Because what the sentence means changes in response to how the person reacts to it. Now, you've got to then decide, do we want a system which is absolutely transparent and explicit, but which is blunt in the, in the way that it handles individual cases? 
or do we want a system which is actually a little bit complicated, where we have to trust discretionary decision makers to exercise professional judgment in the collective best interest of the public? <coughs> That's a political choice. Miss McKenzie. Oh, well. <laughs> Can't get the staff. You can't get the staff. Uh, Elaine, where are you? There you are. I know. It's a hard day. I know. I thank you very much, uh, convener. And that's, uh, although I think, in principle, I like what is now being suggested better than the previous suggestion. I'm, I'm uncomfortable about the way this has been done. That This originally was an amendment to the Criminal Justice Bill at stage two, came back as a bill. Now it's going to be significantly... Uh, yeah, amended again at stage two, and I'm uncomfortable with that process. But can I just ask you, I mean, um, Professor Tata referred to uh, the Sentencing Commission, which reported in 2005, uh, and then there was legislation, the Custodial Sentences and Weapons Bill Act passed in 2007, but I, you know, I understand there were quite a number of issues around that, some of which were flagged up by the McLeish Commission. And then that act was amended by another act in 2010, which I think was the Licensing and Criminal Justice Act. How different is what is being proposed here from what was proposed after the two, you know, after 2010? Yeah. You know, how, how different is this now from what, what exists, what was possible after the, the, the second act was passed in 2010? That's a very interesting question you, you raise. Um, I suppose the answer to that is we don't know because mm. there's no, there's, there are no principles really in what's being proposed. There's just mm -hmm. two bold intentions. That's what it is. So one ends up just speculating about what that might look like. Mm -hmm. So one option might be to use one part of the, uh, the Commission's, that was the Sentencing Commission 2005's recommendation, mm -hmm. which was then mm -hmm. followed up with the, the 2007 Act, which was, mm -hmm. is the combined sentence mm -hmm. regime, which I think Professor McNeil was alluding to there. And yes, I, I also agree that has merit, because you're able to name this is the custodial part, this is the mm. community part, it's part of one overall package. I think that mm. is a fairly sensible thing to do. But again, we're just we're speculating. Mm. We just don't know what, 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 what is intended here. And um, perhaps um, it is an incredibly thorny issue, so I have great sympathy with government and, the, and officials trying to work out what to do. But that's why we need, to, we need a, a proper process of reflection, review, um, to work that out. So, I mean, the recommendation would still be that the bill's withdrawn and the you know, Sentencing Council <coughs> considers it and so on, yeah. rather than we press on with the, well, a preferable uh, you know, amendment to the, well, the current bill. I, I, I would guess so. I mean, obviously, if you can keep the bit that mm. Mr White was referring to about the, you know, the mm. two days, three days, mm. whatever, at least that, that's very good. But the rest mm. of it, it's, it's, one's just left scratching one's head about what, what's intended. So we end up speculating, and I'm not sure mm. that's necessarily the best way of going about it. But, but yes, the combined sentence idea, I think, mm. has real merit. Mm. I, and I agree, I think we... I think I mean, if I may, yes, you, you, you have seen from the evidence submitted this time that um, as, as witnesses or roundtable participants, whatever we are today, we're all, in a, we're all in a difficult position because we don't actually know what's being proposed. So we've, we've got option A and we've got option B and we've, in, we've tried to interpret the Minister's intentions. If the intention is that we, we now have a system where if, if, if the prisoner doesn't satisfy the parole board, then they may max out, complete the custodial sentence and then be subject to further compulsory supervision that that could not be supported, and I doubt its legality. So yes, th yes. there's a, there's a fundamental problem with that if that's the proposal. If the proposal is that we have a period of compulsory supervision that's part of the original sentence, then we're back to a variation of what we currently have. We're just changing the the, the moment in the process at which we determine that we must release. Um, so you know, neither of these strikes me as being adequate. Uh, neither of them will address the truth in sentencing objective or the questions more broadly of retributive justice. Um, and we, have, we don't have the evidence base presented to us to, to make an assessment on their likely effect on public safety. But my, my sort of general understanding of those issues from criminological research is that there's very little reason to believe that the, the lengthening of the time spent in custody is going to have a net positive effect on post-release outcomes no reason to believe that that would be the case. So um, I think it's back to the drawing board, to be frank. Professor Tantin. Just briefly to say, in, in answer to Elaine Murray's 
Very interesting question. The key difference, of course, as well with the 2007 Act, unlike the Commission's 2005 report, is that the 2007 Act failed or chose to ignore front door sentencing. And that was the biggest problem of all, as well as, well as the fact it tried to push things down to 14 days, which was absurd. Um, so that's the other key difference. You have to... as it wasn't rectified by, in 2010 by the, no. the, the amendments. You have to look at front door and back door together, as Professor McNeill said earlier. That's crucial. I'm going to ask Margaret, you're next. Yeah. <clears throat> I think there's a real danger here that we're, we're missing the point, I think, as Professor McNeill says. Uh, eight years we've been looking at automatic early release. We've got a bill in front of us that isn't fit for purpose. We're now looking at a stage two amendment that's going to radically improve, but still not give total transparency in sentencing. If you want that, you, you move to victim support's point of view and um, just um, do away with all automatic early release. But the point that's being missed here, the whole... The whole reason d'etre behind the Act was supposed to be public safety, and public safety, then you have to look at reoffending rates and the revolving door. And there's a very real danger. We put this to a sentencing commission, we put it into the long grass, we delay things even further, and we don't look at what's happening just now in prisons, or even if the prison sentence is being properly looked at as the proper disposal at the time and are all community sentences on the full facts available. Are the facts full the full facts available at the point of sentencing? So I think we're very much in danger at this stage where we are just now of saying, yeah, it'd be great to have consultation and, and yeah, that would be good to put it to a sentencing committee. But what's that remit going to be? How long is it going to report on? And what's going to happen to the rehabilitation that we know is not taking place in prison now to give people the chance to be rehabilitated and not to present um, a, a, a threat to, to the public. So by just narrowly looking at, yeah, this is what et automatic early release or what early release will need now, the automatic part is, is out of it, here's how we deal with the, sub the problem of cold release, we're really missing the big picture here. I think that would be very, very dangerous. I don't know whether that was in... I think it was an evidence. I think it was evidence you were giving me about it. But who am I to challenge you? You frighten me sometimes. <laughs> Professor McNeil, only well, sometimes. <laughs> I, think, I, I think I agree to a certain extent in, in that, um, you know, at the end of, of the submission I made with Dr Barry this time, there's a suggestion that really if we want to look at public safety, we have to look much more seriously at reintegration. Um, but that's that's all clearly a related question to the question of release. But but the the technical arrangements for how you do release don't address the question of reintegration at all. I think to be fair to the prison service um, in their organisational review and in the the resultant reform efforts and in their response to the committee's work on purposeful activities, there is energy and effort going into reforming prison regimes in a constructive way. But that will take time and it will take resources. And if the prison service res resources are deflected into absorbing increases in the prison population, then it's likely capacity to do the creative and constructive rehabilitative work that we all want um, will be diminished. So we have to hold the prison population down in order to improve the quality of prison regimes. And we also have to hold the prison population down so that we can spend the money making the reintegration process effective. So it, that's why we have to do the front door... That's why we have to do the front door issue at the same time, because if, we, if we're not serious about how we control and manage the prison population in the first place, then we can forget rehabilitation and reintegration. It just won't happen. You'll have an overcrowded, inefficient system which warehouses people and then ejects them back into society um, in conditions which are dangerous for them and dangerous for others. Mr White, do you want to do that? I think that the point being made about uh, long-term sentences and the um, how long will it take before we can agree what's a good way forward to deal with release, I think that's missing the point that long-term prisoners are less likely to re-offend than short-term prisoners. And I think that the, the work that is done to support long-term prisoners um, is something that we should thank the SPS for because the, the, their, um, their effectiveness is, is evident. And the idea of... Um, glossing over the fact that short-term prisoners who go out and come back, go out and come back. There are over 20,000 liberations from prison a year at the moment, and those aren't all long-term prisoners, not by a long shot. And I think that getting rid of that would be a helpful thing to do, but to rush into... Can I, sorry, Mr. White, I perhaps should have done this earlier. 
I want us to focus on the bill. I mean, yeah, I'm we just, agree I'm there's all these other issues, but this bill <clears throat> apparently was flawed at the start, and apparently from what you're saying now, it's still flawed. Yes. In that it's um, big changes are being made, have not been properly consulted on, and the impact, and there's the sentencing council. I want us to focus on that, because we have to write a report at stage one for the government about what we, obviously you know this from listening to My it. My apologies for saying... No, it's not your fault. I mean, I've let, it, I've let it run a bit, but really it's to be very focused. We, I think we can accept the position about releasing people at different uh, days of the week. It's not, that's not an issue. But there is, a, there is the issue about is this curable or do we just say, no, this cannot be amended? Because remember, at stage two, you can... Put, uh, as we know from the Criminal Justice Bill, stage two can be set forth and let a long, long time you can take evidence. And that's really what we need to look at is, can this be, in the way the government is suggesting, amended, or is this so big a thing, notwithstanding the issues that you've raised, Mark, very important, it's been a long time getting here, that we have to start again. And that's really what I seem to be hearing from you. And that would be helpful to the committee. I, th I think we should start again. In the uh, policy memorandum, the government makes it quite clear that there has been no formal public consultation and this is a manifesto commitment. So where does a manifesto commitment come in to, to say? I think it was a manifesto. Sorry. No, no, <laughs> just no. You, that's fine. You interact. I think it was a manifesto commitment, if I'm not mistaken, in the 2007. I mean, I know it was a minority government then, but it was a 2007 commitment. I think most of the parties were had that as a kind of slogan. Um, as a as a headline point, as a principle, as a principle. <laughs> as a principle Thank you. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I mean, that's really what we're talking about, John. You, you're um, you're waiting to cast. What's your? It, it was about this point, and indeed, forgive me, Professor McNeil, because I don't have your initial um, evidence, um, but you alluded to it there, and it is the circumstances in which we as parliamentarians find ourselves discussing things, and the extent to which public opinion, whatever that might be shapes it, because I think in your earlier evidence you talked about the background giving rise to these manifesto commitments. Um, so, you, you know, you, you might say, well, this is very positive. We had a cabinet secretary who in a short period has listened and, and looked. Can you comment on the circumstances in which, if you like, law has been made and whether this is the best way to do it, please? Oh, I don't, I don't want to open it to a big discussion like that, well, 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 it's, but it, 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 it does relate to the very much the circumstances we find that have changed in a short period. I, this is a stage one inquiry, and I want us to focus on this particular the specifics of this bill, which I think we'd accept there were good intentions perhaps in it, but because we've had this move in it, raised by the previous evidence session, that we want to see where we're going with this to do justice to what is, I think, our, you know, we, we you seem to agree that you want to end automatic early release. I didn't hear dissent round on Christian allies, but is, this is not perhaps the best way to do it. All I, all I would say is that, um, you, well, this is maybe too philosophical, you can have populist democracy or you can have deliberative democracy. And if we're talking about... A, Both. Yeah, well, my, my point would be that uh, in an area of policy making as complicated as this and as important as this in terms of getting it right, you need a deliberative process which involves public consultation and public debate and dialogue about these issues, but which is not reactive to the misrepresentation of the existing system in media and public discourse. That's what happened in 2006-07. Uh, when the 2007 Act was passed and I was advising the committee at that time, the evidence, the deliberative process in the committee was excellent, um, but there was an election looming and stage three went a different way from where I thought the evidence was leading the committee at that time in relation to the Custodial Sentences and Weapons Act. I understand the realities of that. I'm not naive about it. But I do think that um, it, it's critically important for there to be cross-party political leadership on a deliberative democratic process about how to get this right. It's too important to, to mess with um, in the populist way. I don't, I don't think we dispute that on, on, on this issue. Can I? I'm interested, Roddy, yes. Yeah, no, I just wanted to actually ask Mr. Murch for some further evidence uh, beyond what we had uh, from Mr. McConnell about 
kind of the workings of rehabilitation programs, the want of a better word, reducing, reoffending in the prison service at the current time. Uh, how much, you know, how much of a delay is it? Is there in actually in getting on these programs? Um. Programs. I mean, we we have we delivered last year around fourteen hundred programs or approved activities to prisoners around the estate. Um, there is a waiting list, and we base that on critical dates. Um, but it's actually more complex again than that, because some prisoners will deny that they have a problem until very close to the critical date, and then try to move up the list. Or people are recalled into custody. We currently have about 675, I think, recalls in the system, who we have to mobilise quickly, which means that um, um, it, is, it is not reasonable that we can always catch everybody who scores with a lower uh, need. Um, the Supreme Court, I have to say, and the point was made about potential legal challenge. Um, there's no jurisprudence at the moment which would suggest that there was a risk with the terminate sentence prisoners, so, so we would have to say that at this juncture. I would also say that the Scottish Prison Service and the organisation in view has been, um, been mentioned is looking to turn around another number of its processes, including conducting a full psychology and programme review in order to ensure that we, we see the gaps and we're able to mobilise better. We're changing the way our staff operate in order to ensure that they can do brief interventions and do different type of intervention type activity, not big programmes, because this issue isn't just about programme delivery. Prisoners actually change and are rehabilitated in the work that builds their social capital, <coughs> their linkages back into society, as well as learning skills about thinking and different ways about how they do things. So the prison service for the last year and for the next five years will be really concentrating on changing how it does its business and the role of prison officers. Now that's actually quite a big ask. It's a big training task for the organisation, but it's about changing we do business. We've also committed to having 42 um, currently um, through care support officers. The reason for that is the Scottish Prison Service recognises the importance of through care and the fact that real rehabilitation actually happens in community and people need support in order to reintegrate back into the community. So in other words, waking up to the fact that it doesn't stop at the prison gate. No, committee's well yeah. informed on that. Um, yes, Ms Crombie. Um, I'd just like to reiterate that we do actually support the ending of um, automatic early release. Um, to us, it, it does take away from the complexity for victims' understanding um, when the offender is going to be released. So many times we will get phone calls saying that they received a letter, they don't understand the sentence and at the front end of it, front door of it, <coughs> and now they've received a letter to say that the offender is up for release or you know, into the community. We absolutely recognise the importance and the, the, the relevance of um, supervision and reintegration into the community. It really is about making sure, though, that the victim has their choice and they're aware of that and also they have a choice of any perceived personal safety to themselves. So if they wish to know that they don't want to bump into the offender into this area where they know the offender may be, it's their choice to avoid that error. It's their choice to move their kids from school if they so wish. And that's important to the victim to have that awareness and understanding. Well, would you have concerns if um, this ending, whatever we call it, automatic early release, was deferred for a considerable period? Would you have concerns from the point of view of your organisation? I believe we would, yes. Yeah. I think that's where we have to have your assistance with this. Um, with regard to the letter from the Cabinet Secretary, how, if possible, it would be possible to move this bill forward rather than, I think, you, in your speech, you know, long, because we're out the long grass for a long time. Mm. Professor Tata. I can, I can see that. The problem is the letter here from the Cabinet Secretary is trying to combine two things, which the big question is how do you combine them? So both are virtues. Both we would probably agree with. I think uh, so to that extent, it's a, it's a good thing. Um, but the big question is, how do you do that? And there are, there's a whole range of questions of principle and practice and logistics, but just basic principles that need to be thought about. 
before one can do that. So there is the worry about rushing this. As, you, as Margaret Mitchell said, we've had eight years, perhaps for understandable reasons, but now it almost feels like there's a, there's a desire. Suddenly there's, a, there's, there's, there's an urgency. It must be done straight away. Um, so we, Even if yeah, it's we, possible for a committee to, for example, either um, ask, or to, the government would do, is actually to defer a stage two, or even at a stage two for a committee to take further evidence on specific amendments to the bill. That's what I'm getting at. You know, how would one manage this if it's manageable, rather than perhaps defer this for years and years and years again? Because at least if you've got something in front of you, yeah. there's an earth, there's some, you've got to do something. You can't yeah. just extend it. I yes, mean, uh, Professor Mc oh, Sorry, I'll take sorry, Professor Sorry, just Professor briefly. Uh, um, I mean, absolutely, I think the, the work of the committee is to be welcomed, but the committee, I guess, has to respond to those amendments coming from government. And the question is, how will the government come up with those amendments if it doesn't consult and have time to think those but That's through? what I'm saying. It is possible at stage two. To, you don't have to keep to a, yeah. a, a short timetable for a stage two. You can ask for a stage two. The committee can ask for time, almost like another stage one, in taking evidence. To and so on, on amendments. True, but we're necessarily then reacting to those amendments brought forward by government. And my okay, concern is no. how well th thought through will those amendments be? How imaginative can the committee be in that situation? Professor McNeill, and then I'll take um, Ms McKenzie. Yes, Professor McNeill. To, to, to pick up on um, the point from, uh, from Sarah, if, if we persevere, if the government um, and the committee choose to persevere with the bill, and it's option two, option B. So we're not talking about additional supervision. We're, to, uh, we're talking about it within the framework of the existing sentence. Then to meet victim support's legitimate demand for clarity, um, the bill would have to include provisions to change the way in which sentencing was described, <coughs> the way in which it was explained, the way in which it was made uh, clear uh, uh, in the first instance. And that isn't currently a purpose or a, a stated intention of the bill, so there's a, there's a problem there, but maybe that's a remediable problem within the context of parli parliamentary procedure. I'm not expert on that. So that, that's, <laughs> that's, that's one point. But then a, a, a second point is, if you go down that route and you're looking at option B, which is a period of compulsory supervision within the existing sentence, then the key question would be about what what would the evidence base be that you would review at stage two in order to arrive at a determination about the timing issues? And you've already kind of identified that in the questions that you that you gave us in advance of this session. Mm -hmm. We haven't really been very able to answer them clearly because we don't know the clear intentions of the bill. I've given you a best, Monica, Barry and I have given you a best guess on how we would maybe frame that um, if that was the intent. But it's, for me, it's, the, the fundamental problem here is that we're muddying the waters by talking simultaneously about clarity and sentencing and public safety. And these are two related issues, and they're both important issues, but we can't tackle one by doing something that claims to be about the other. So, you know, victim support's position is completely understandable from the perspective of victims' interests, uh, legitimate interests in having clarity and understanding of the situation that they're in. Um, but I, I find it hard to see how this bill which is crafted around public safety, can address their legitimate interests. I'll take you in, Ms McKenzie. I've just been checking and advice that it might be possible uh, to get that clarity about the sentencing and so on in the Criminal Justice Bill, which will get my, much, much wider remit. I know I may be clutching at proverbial straws, but that, that is maybe a possibility. Ms McKenzie. Um, I mean, some of these points have already been made by Professor Tart and Professor McNeil, but... I come back to the point that woven into the bill is an assumption that keeping people in jail for longer is what will improve public safety. And I think what a lot of us are saying is, where's the evidence base for that? And if you advance, and I said this at the last session, if you advance a bill on the platform of improving public safety and the measures you then take, you trumpet and you talk about this is wonderful, it's going to improve public safety, and if something happens, you then run the risk of increasing public levels of cynicism about the criminal justice system, which, as we know, and victim support have said themselves, are also already running quite high. They don't understand a lot of sentencing policy. And if you advance something on a platform, you must deliver on that. Otherwise, you could increase cynicism about the criminal justice system. And that's, that's not what any of us want. We're content about cold release. I think we've, mm. we've taken that. 
Gill. Um, one of the comments made about the committee reacting to the government and the letter, of course we do, we need to do that. But we also need to react to what we hear in evidence from panels that come before us. And my recollection is that we could pretty well, around the table, uh, concentrated on cold release. And it would seem to me that what the government's letter proposes is that cold release doesn't actually happen. And I would like comments, have I got that wrong? Is, is this not what we've been told by, by uh, the Minister, the Cabinet Secretary, as you'd say? Well, they are, that, that's what the letter says, but it doesn't tell us how. And that's what leaves us in, a, in, a, in a conundrum about option A or option B. Um, as I just said, the, the problem with option B is that, although it, I think it's option A is not workable from my perspective or from my understanding of the law and the evidence, option B is workable but it doesn't actually address victim support's concern because it effectively creates a new system of automatic release but calls it something else and changes the dates. That's what option B, that's the yeah, net effect of option B. So I think unless the bill can be amended or some other legislative device can be found justice. so that um, something is done about clarity in, se in sentencing in the first instance, then we can't address victim support's concerns appropriately or deliver what they're requesting. Um. Elaine? I, I, I suppose I'd well, invite comment on uh, an alternative, I suppose, in that we know that the 2000, uh, 2007 Act was, in, was passed but not enacted. The uh, amendments of the 2010 Act were passed but not enacted. Another possibility would be to pass the legislation but not to enact it until some of the front end issues had been addressed. Is that another possibility? We've been there. Mm. Uh, that, was, that was 2007, and yeah. it's still sitting on the statute book, unenacted, yeah. which is part of the political pressure that leads to this effort. Mm. Um, so I, I, I don't think it makes sense to... Personally, I don't think it makes sense to pass a, an act uh, that you know you're not intending to implement. Um, but, but you don't enact it until certain other things have taken place, which was what was supposed to be happening. Well, I, I guess that was in the mm. McLeish Commission's... Mm. Yeah, you're right ab about that, but um, we're still a long way off the 5,000 that mm. McLeish recommended as the point mm. at which the, the Seesaw Act might have been implemented. Mm. Professor Tessa. Oh, I, just to agree with that, and also I suppose I, I'm slightly uneasy about passing... I'm not sure that you were suggesting this, Elaine Murray, but, uh, at all, but about passing legislation which we think is probably not very good mm -hmm. and the hope that then the executive branch, the government of the day, even if we might trust this government or whatever, the government of the day will then sort things out. It worries me that, you know, another government might be far less responsible. I think you meant, you I don't think that's what you you're meant. deferring mm. while other yeah, well, mechanisms are in place, yeah. for okay. example. Yeah. Um, but in the meantime, we must make sure that any legislation that's passed mm. is the very, very best that it can be. This, is, this would be the most well, radical that change between that the That certainly would be the committee's view as well. Yeah, Please I, uh, indeed, understand I that. Yeah. Roddy, yeah, yes. I just wanted to take up um, <laughs> Ms McKenzie's point about empirical evidence. What are you suggesting empirical evidence, for example, elsewhere would show in relation to public safety? Is there empirical evidence out there? Well, I, I'm probably not the best person to answer that. I'm not an academic, but... I mean, evidence that suggested that holding people in custody for longer rather than releasing them and supervising them for the remainder of their sentence was actually likely to lead to fewer uh, instances of reoffending and thereby increased public safety. But, I mean, there might be other people around the table. Ferguson has got some hand up. Recently um, published National Academies of Sciences report from the United States and a, a very high-powered commission led by some of the well, I say the world's leading criminologists under the leadership of Professor Jeremy Travis of John Jay College in New York, and uh, the reports on the consequences of um, the rise in imprisonment in the United States. And one of the things that it considers is the effect of that on crime rates. It reaches the conclusion, which has been reached before by criminologists, that even massive increases in rates of incarceration produce marginal effects on crime rates. Um, and that's a different question from the, the more specific question that this bill seeks to address in relation to public safety. Obviously not all crime raises major issues of public safety, although all crime is uh, of legitimate public concern, obviously. So um, 
I'm I'm not aware of any credible evidence that lengthening sentences in and of itself guarantees us the more effective management of risk that the bill seems to be trying to be about. Um, I'm not able to put it more forcefully than that because I, I think it's actually very difficult to do um, the kinds of research that would allow you to experimentally test different release arrangements for obvious reasons of justice. You don't really get to do that kind of experiment in criminology for very good reasons. So I, I can't put it more strongly than that, but I, I could say that evidence about desistance from crime, which is more my specialised subject, would suggest that it's not the timing of release, it's uh, the experience of imprisonment, uh, the access to the services that are needed, the manner of release, the support that follows release, and um, wider issues about public acceptance and reintegration in the community that matter for um, for the medium and long term in terms of somebody's uh, potential risk or otherwise to public safety. I have to laugh because while you're doing that, I have Professor Tata's in, then he's out, then he's in, then he's out. Because <laughs> <laughs> you've always covered everything. As long as, as long as he doesn't. <laughs> I mean, believe you me, that's a fact. Yeah. Margaret. There's a, 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 a kind of false argument here that, you know, if we keep somebody longer, then that will improve public safety. It will only improve public safety if on release they are a, a threat to the public. And surely the the sentence and, and a custodial sentence is first and foremost does this individual present a threat to public safety? And if they, they, they do and there isn't any way to eliminate that other than a public sentence, it will be a custodial sentence. Now, it seems to me there should be some clarity and transparency in that custodial sentence, and therefore I agree with victim support, abolish all automatic early release. But the key point is, what do you do with that individual while they're in prison? And that's what we're not focusing on. We've had very good things from Mr March, but the point is the resources aren't there. I had a meeting with Circle yesterday, and there was an individual, short-term sentence, and you're quite right, Mr um, uh, Allard, it is, Mr White, um, that it is short-term sentence with a re-offending more and, and where they do th present a threat to the public, therefore, in, in terms of the behaviour that, that's escalating. But there was no support. All the through care that's supposed to be there, not there. The individual himself was saying, yeah, I'm excited about getting out, but I'm wondering if I'm better here because I know I don't have any housing to go to. I know that um, when I get out there, then the temptations will be there. Until we address that fundamental point, then I don't think the, the bill of where we're going around of this discussion is, is fit for purpose. Right. Well, you've got that off your chest a lot, of which we probably agree, but my point is to get back to this. We're dealing with a bill and we that's where we're back at and to the point of uh, and I have to say I was quite attracted to be a custodial and community, but then that has to be dealt with in the sentencing council. It has to be clear for victim support. It maybe doesn't fit into this bill. All I'm looking at is, is there a, 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 an opportunity, given the procedures of Parliament, where we might, uh, no, I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary is listening to this, uh, where we either cease at stage one of a really thorough uh, stage two uh, pause while there's con some consultation, uh, or the committee can move on to stage two with amendments and take evidence and take longer over and get that time from the Bureau rather than park it, which would park also, by the way, the issues you've raised um, regarding different times of the day release. I don't think we could just go ahead with that, frankly. So it's really how we manage this so that uh, we keep the foot on the accelerator, but not just for the sake of doing that, to deliver good legislation, but to get on with it rather than again have years of this. And that's really what I'm looking at from you uh, 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 with the evidence. We accept, I think, we have accept many of the issues you've raised. But so, I suppose I'm going to go around and ask you about that and just say, where do we, what your view would be? And I'll start, if, if I may, with Miss Crombie. Just come round, everybody. Yeah, we, we support the ending and, um, of uh, automatic uh, release. However, we do recognise and acknowledge that there may be further ev evidence that's required to be gathered. So your thing is to go in some manner to, to continue? Mm, absolutely. Professor yes. Tata. Uh, you can end automatic early release, but in order to ensure, as the aim of the letter says, that uh, everyone gets a mandatory period of, I assume, conditional supervision, you have to reinvent it 
maybe by some other name. I think there are ways of doing that. But I think you're really asking about the process, I think, convener. Um, to some extent, I'm not sure I feel I am the best person uh, to, to answer that. No, I'm not except asking about that process. There are ways of resolving this. Uh, uh, and, and I mean, I think, okay. I think we accept issues that you've raised and the complexity yes. in, in the interaction with the Sentencing yes. Council, interaction with other things. But it is, you know, how do we as a committee deal with this? Should, should we um, an alternative just say, we throw it out, we start again? Or we look at a way of amending this bill to make it fit with the principles that the well, government's come forward with? Because it can be done, but I just don't know if that's what you want to do. Do you think it's worthwhile? Yes. I mean, what we have from the government, of course, at the moment is just a letter with two intentions. Correct. That's all we have. So, that's right, but that's and funny. if we take it through, if we, if we don't, if the bill isn't withdrawn, then the question is, what will the bill look like? And we're, we're necessarily responding to that. My concern isn't so much that the committee, the committee clearly is trying to do what it can to look at that, is how will the government then bring forward its proposals, on what basis, how will it consult, will it consult? Because necessarily one is reacting to that. One can try to react imaginatively, but one's reacting to what the government has put forward. Um, so, uh, many... Cabinet Secretary in front of us, for example, mm. and raise these issues mm. and ask for, and as I say, no doubt they're listening to this evidence, yeah. and ask them, well, here are the issues that have been raised in front of the committee. Mm. Do you have solutions I suppose to this? My, my concern, Convener, is that, as, as you know, and everyone around this table will know, that this is not only a very technical area, and it's mm. incredibly complex, yes. the law is in unbelievably complex, but um, it's also, as you know, politically charged and we have you know obviously two elections coming up um, and that that you know that's obviously that obviously makes the option of trying to give it to an impartial body to look at a little bit more attractive I don't know what impartial body you're talking about such as the sentencing council for instance Professor McNeil well I think minimally um, I, I, I don't know parliamentary procedure, so I don't know exactly what your latitude is um, in terms of persevering. But if you were persevering, then I think minimally um, extending the period of deliberation so that it can involve dialogue with the Sentencing Council yes. and with others about their plans and um, their views on the relationship between first instance sentencing and release decision making would be necessarily part of that extended process at stage two. My, my fundamental problem, though, is, is this. Um, when, for, when Jack McConnell as first minister announced in Parliament that automatic early release would end, he did it under pressure on a truth and sentencing point, which I think came um, from the opposition at that time in 2006-07. Um, when the parties, all except the Scottish Socialists in the committee, voted to um, let the um, seesaw custodial sentences and weapons um, bill go forward to stage three they agreed that the principles were good but that there were flaws in the detail and they did that all under pressure of an imminent election where they were responding to uh, popular opinion about the fact that early release automatic early release didn't seem to be delivering justice uh, as people understood it now again, I think we're in a similar situation where, uh, for political reasons, um, a new minister, I, I maybe shouldn't go this far, but I, I will, um, a new minister um, wants to, to grasp the nettle and address this issue, um, which is about saying uh, this justice policy in Scotland is going to be smart and it's going to be progressive and it's going to take social justice seriously, but it's also not going to be soft um, and, and cuddly. Um, and so grasping the nettle makes a certain degree of political sense, but then muddying it up with a whole uh, extended discussion of risk and public safety causes, for me, a fundamental problem with what's before you. So to return to a point I made earlier, I think a lot depends on whether the committee wants and whether the government wants clarity, which is, I think, Victim Support's core point, or whether it wants to pursue public safety, or better, how it wants to balance these two uh, important objectives. I think it's feasible to do option B um, with an extended stage two deliberation that involves dialogue with the Sentencing Council and others. Um, if I had my way, I would, 
I would tear it up and start again and do the thing properly and comprehensively. But if for other reasons it's important to persevere, then I think it would have to be an extensive stage two that does that. Fair enough. It's a, a, a fine and, and extensive explanation <coughs> of position, which is what we want. Yeah, thank you. I, I think uh, my comments in relation to your question are less ethical and more around about how we actually uh, manage the process around about public protection. So I think for me there's a question that outstanding and it referred to the earlier comment I made around how effective are our current arrangements in terms of the review of MAPA because whatever the detail will be will we require a multi-agency response to this. Yes. So that, that's important for us. The, the question around the effectiveness of our current arrangements. Second point, I think, in relation to this is around about we are in, in straightened financial times. So the resource that follows this in terms of how we manage those uh, increased individuals and the intensity of service provision that they will require requires uh, some further examination. We're in a process of significant public change in terms of health and social care. We're moving from community justice structures to community planning. How effective and what analysis is done in relation to those changing arrangements, uh, uh, how will that impact on this proposal? How will the proposal to integrate health and social care, how will those uh, uh, policy commitments impact on this, on this set of arrangements? So for those much more operational focused matters, I think it requires greater deliberation. And if those can only complement the more procedural aspects or the more ethically based aspects around the complications of how you make law and how you address facets of law, I, I think it leads me to suggest that it requires a further period of reflections, consultations and analysis. Well, I mean, you, I take your, it's very important the point you made because there's no point in making law that can't be implemented for practical <laughs> reasons, you know. So you or, make the or, or, or if I may also add, or understanding the, uh, the, the impact the financial, of that law. No, no, oh. absolutely. Uh, Mr March. I'm not sure it's for SBS to comment except to say that obviously we will contribute and if the bill is enacted or when the bill is enacted, we will be ready for it to come into place. Thank you very much. Ms Gailey. Yes, um, I'd like to follow up on uh, Mr McKendrick's points to say that if, if the concern here is in relation to public protection and the, the management of the risk that are, pose, are posed by those who have the present the, the greatest risk of serious harm, then the point that we want to get to is that the release is, is, is carefully considered, the timing of it, the support, the planning and the management, the management of, of that release requires to be considered. And I think what we need further scoping of, given the resources that would be involved in that uh, for the parole board and for the, uh, the, the community services as well, is that we would need to understand the, the, the number and the characteristics and the circumstances of the cases that give particular concern at the moment. And I, and I, and I think uh, in taking this forward that it would, it would be valuable to have more evidence about that. Thank you very much. Mr White. I find myself in a tricky position here because um, ideally I would tear this up and start again. But in the interests partly from... Victim Support Scotland, but also from the evidence from the academics, um, I recognise that it's important to be positive and to move forward. And so if I can be assured, as I feel I can be, that the stage two process can embrace the concerns round the table, then I will go with it. Ms McKenzie. Um, I would agree with Professor McNeill. My idea would be to start again and actually present the empirical base for it going forward. Um, so the stage two extension is kind of a less than ideal, but in pragmatic terms, maybe that's all that you will feel that you're able to do. But I mean, just return to the point about the release Not period as stated in the two page letter. I mean, option A of tagging this on to the end of the sentence, I can't, I cannot see that that's uh, workable. But option B really is automatic. Don't know, they're all, we're all sort of going, no, we don't think no. that that's. But I mean, option you know, B. It's automatically released by another name. And this is what I mean about public cynicism. It yeah. wasn't about the cold release. It was about, you know, I completely agree with the kind of clarity in sentencing. People say, well, this is automatic release. We're just calling it something different. In which case, why are we doing this? So. Well, I'm, I'm <laughs> whether the Cabinet Secretary and the Government thank you for your evidence is quite another matter. But I thank you. Thank you very much for your evidence. And uh, can I say to the committee, uh, we do have time. Uh, to call the Cabinet Secretary, I think, to answer uh, the issues that have been raised in this. I think that would be 
uh, you would wish to go forward in that way. I'm looking round for nods from my committee, but they, yes. Oh, I see Margaret's already got her pencil sharpened. Right, uh, thank you very much. That um, ends this evidence session. Thank you. to Parliament on the General Principles Bill in mid-March. Mid-March, okay? Our next meeting will be the 3rd of March. Some of them don't know when we're meeting because they're talking. We're still in session. Our next meeting will take place on the 3rd of March when we'll begin taking evidence at Stage 1 of the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Bill. And I hope that before that we've got a chance to each to report on our um, when we went out recently to the various organisations. So we'll put that factor that in. Okay, that ends this session. You may now you may now communicate with each other in an informal fashion.